You know, there's, you know, there's certainly, certainly, you know, if you, you, know, if you look at when. Some of the some issues, of the issues that, are that are a little more time, time consuming. consuming. There's been some frustrations with that. With that. Uh, but, this uh, but this corner hopping, corner hopping corner jumping, jumping topic, topic, this is really, really not really something not that I believe this task, 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 task force should be trying to weigh in on. And so and we've, so we've talked, talked about it. About it and we're just going to do that again and not even talk about it at all. So I know there was some schedule to have a presentation today on that. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, but not we're not even going to waste our time. We've got bigger fish to fry. We can have to make a difference on. on. So we're going to move gonna forward, move with, forward that. with that today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. appreciate that, Josh. That, 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 um, you know, that, you know, that, that topic's that being litigated, litigated us. And us weighing in on that is, is, is probably, probably uh, fruitless uh, until, until we see what happens, what happens with that. With that. So, so um, you know, one of the other things we do appreciate all the comment we get. We get. I know that my mother passed the task force been called. We've got emails. Sometimes we even get even get stale mail letters. And that's, and that's really, that's really appreciated. appreciated. That's why we, why we have to we put have things, to put out, things there. out there. Um, the um, task force, the task force wasn't, wasn't created because all these all issues were easy. Were easy. Um, it was um, created because, because it was, it was, these are hard to hard solve issues. issues. So when we, so put, when we put something out there, we don't want to have, have public comment on it. on it. It doesn't mean it's in stone. But we have to put those things out there. out there. I mean, it does help if you're having some questions on what was discussed in our meeting, to go back and look at the information that we were given. On, on our website, website. Um, you, can, um, even, you can, even can even even watch can back, watch back, back I know that's that extremely boring, but, boring, but um, you can um, watch, you back, watch and back and listen to the conversation that we had. So I think, so that I think that's, that's, um, that's really that's important, really important to, uh, to, uh, to let people to let know. People know um, um, we are really we trying, trying some, at some point, we have to have to public comment on something, so we have to have put something out there. Um, so um, anyway, so anyway, we we appreciate appreciate that continued comment. So, so we need to process 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 process
<laughs> it, 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 yeah, and, and I would just on that, it is a big issue. We know it's a big issue, but but, but this task force could spend, spend all of our time, time on that issue and never get anything else. We know, we know being litigated, being litigated, litigated is going to happen. Right. So yeah. we don't still have full authority. And so besides that, I guess I guess I would, I would entertain an approval of approval minutes, minutes um, from the last meeting, last meeting in the agenda. agenda. Okay, it's been moved by Adam and by Albert to approve the agenda in the minutes. Any discussion on that? Go ahead. One quick thing. I noticed we have the updates from Joe and from Pat, and I think that that's the same. Subcommittee and that's the work that was done on the owner license. So just so folks know, that's one of the same topic and the order that we tackle them in. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Terry. Okay, okay, any any other, any other discussion, discussion on, that? on that? Okay, hearing, hearing none, all in favor all say aye. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? opposed? Yeah, motion passes. Motion passes. Um, um, I guess we'll just go around really, really quickly, quickly and, and, and if anybody and has, has any updates. updates. Um, um, and uh, yeah. uh, I think by, by now everybody knows everybody, but it doesn't hurt to just tell us where we are again and again, 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 uh, and, uh, give us any updates. So we'll start we'll with Dwayne. No, 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 Never mind. We'll, go, we'll start with Albert. Albert. <laughs> Um, um, and, and love to and hear love your updates, updates, updates as folks have folks been, been um, talking, um, to talking to you, sending you sending mail, mail, email, email uh, talking uh, to your talk university or whatever, or whatever else, else, so public, that public comments, comments in whatever format, if you're going you to share, share any of those high, high points, points um, um, been a bit since we've met. Mike start with that? Sure, sure. My name is Albert Summers, I'm a branch rancher, legislator from the Southern County, I've been my whole life, my whole life. Um, yes, yes, uh, my, my role is to, I think here with, because I was appointed by the legislature, that's my, that's my role. And uh, as far as that case, I think, I think more and more and more people are realizing that this is just in the mountain. mountain. And so, and so I'm kind of getting kind of giving the trickle and we know opinions. I guess my, I guess my hope for so the many, 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 do focus, focus on us, us, and we're not down, 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 down. And I think Brian signed something to turn to the dirt, but I'm still not in the agreement. It's going to be good enough to read the part of the That's my hope. Adam, 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 Updates. Updates. It's, 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 it's been a fun start to the year. I've uh, been chasing, chasing kids around the basketball, basketball court. All sorts. Kids, 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 Excited to be that voice, voice where I can be and be a voice and voice for 70,000 hours. It's a hard, 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 I think the people in person, a lot of emails that were directed regarding what's important. Mostly trying to get them involved in the way how to involve responding. Um, I have I have discussions, discussions about this task force every day. So, um, uh, lots of people lots are interested, interested in attention, attention, both in both in my in my department and outside of the department. department. Um, um, I've spent time, time working, working with, with Pat, Pat and, 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 Pete and Larry, Larry Lee, Lee on, on this uh, this uh, on the land owner license, license, license um, um, potential changes. changes. I'll present that to Pat at the last last minute. Can't be here today, so so we get to that. I'll talk through what kind of what. Initial, initial set of thoughts, thoughts or that'll kind of hopefully 
Just to put that information out there like a week or two ago, it's got generated lots of interest on both sides. Thanks, Brian. Lee Livingston, our county commissioner out there, Northwest Wyoming. Yeah, it's been what everyone else says out there, I'm hearing. The, uh, the uh, one thing that Wayne brought this up is, is, is a lot is of things, things from the, the suggestions suggestion come, come out, come out there, there, it's just stone. And I've had, I've had I've been a lot of time to blame the people, people, people that we're not going to get anything done if they don't pick up stuff out of the conversation with starters. starters. And it is not, not as it's been writing as it's happening. And talks and talks about the off the edge of the cliff as far as the land, 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 uh, uh, we're trying to find pretty good, pretty good consensus. A lot, a lot of people with a lot of diverse opinions. I can tell you, hey, uh, this is just part of what I point for. for see, me, see me not pay, not pay a lot of attention. I, 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 I don't care about the friendly stuff. Not end of it. But when we when we sat out, sat out, I and Brian worked with us. These are huge issues, and I can tell you for me, the proposal that came out and went around, I'm not sure how it all got spread, but uh, I have spent hours and hours and hours on the phone back to what Lisa talking about landowners off cliffs. And look, we're, we're not doing this. This is a proposal, and it's come a long way. So you know, I think we're going to see that through these issues, and hopefully we can find some stuff that's common ground and make, make something better for everybody down the road. But uh, we really are on the point that part of the task force that I really have kind of been waiting to see. So uh, hopefully we come to a good spot. Came to good stuff. Tony Lehner, Congress County Commissioner and small landowner and uh, passionate sportsman. Again, uh, I think everybody has kind of seen the same thing in over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of calls and, and comments from landowners in my area. Uh, people are starting to pay more attention to what you know what we're trying to do and, and again misinformation is rampant but uh, so hopefully you know try to make sure that people understand what our, our purpose is and, and how we're going about it I think will help a lot but uh, getting, getting wild out there <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Uh, Rusty Bell small business owner taxidermist County Commissioner, Sportsman, um, appreciate everybody, like I said, appreciate everybody's feedback and, and interest in this um, the task force. I, I've gotten a lot of credit here recently, uh, deserve that uh, one of the hardest to draw elk areas now general, that our task force didn't have anything to do that with fortification in general area this year. So we'll see if I'm also jealous of It's still... Yeah, it's still a challenge, but uh, anyway, I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, feedback and paying attention to this. It is important, and I'm glad, um, glad we'll, we'll deal with all that feedback as it comes. And I'm Josh Corsi, uh, Mealy Fanatic Foundation. I live in western Wyoming, north of Kimmer. I'm a sports person on this task force. I've heard much of the same. If you, if you haven't... Uh, thought that people were engaged. It wasn't until an issue like landowner licenses mm -hmm. was put out and why they come from the landlord to want to give you your opinion on that. That's great because I do believe that the, the public participation and those opinions, right, wrong, or indifferent, are, are still a very important, vital part of this process. I will say since the last time we met on December 3rd, when we still had beautiful fall-like weather, mm -hmm. um, and deer, many of the deer in Western Wyoming were still in in summer ranges, um, we have seen some of those transitions, and I still continue to hear a great concern about the mule deer populations across Wyoming. That seems to be uh, something that, and it could be just, you know, what I do with the Mealy Fanatic Foundation, and that's a, a vessel for people to want to have those discussions, but uh, um, predators and uh, mule deer, that, that those topics seem to resonate across the state with the 
folks and I continue to hear from them. Hey, real quick, Todd, is Lisa on? Is she finally? She did. She, okay, cool. I just saw a message from her that she didn't have to do one. Uh, go ahead, Larry. Yeah, Senator Larry Hicks from Carbon, Sweetwater County, uh, was appointed by the president of the Senate to work on this committee. Um, landowner, sportsman. Um, you know, I think that I guess my biggest concern is, is oftentimes when you see these collaborative efforts like this, is when you run into the really tough issues, there's a tendency just to skirt those and then move on and, and, and do the easy stuff. And then I'm also cognizant of the fact that if we're going to accomplish stuff, we have to get some things done too. So I think it's been so far a good mix of a few things that we've been able to accomplish and make some recommendations. But I think we need to keep hammering away at some of the hard stuff too. Um, so we need a good mix of that. We've got good chairs leading this effort. It's a good group to work with. I think we have paid attention to the public. Uh, we've got input from the outfitters, the landowners, the sportsmen, both those resident and non-resident sportsmen. I certainly read all those comments that come in. The diversity of pendants, but there's also a diversity of misinformation <laughs> that's being disseminated out there on a number of public <clears throat> platforms that I would hope that we can basically ascertain the difference from the fact and the myth. And then we keep plugging away and uh, keep hammering some of these tough issues. In the meantime, also work on some of those issues where we may be able to come to some agreement. It's important, but I think that we continue to move these task force forward. Um, one of the things that I would hope that would come out is to a couple of recommendations that have been made already in the legislature. I'm concerned that if we don't push those things through in the legislature, that meaning the task force actually may be showing up and participating in the legislative process. It undermines the ability of the entire work of the task force if we can't get one or two of our very first recommendations across the finish line. So we have a bigger responsibility just to show up here and debate these and make recommendations. I think there's a responsibility for the members of the task force to get stuff across the finish line too. And so thank you for the opportunity to sit on this task force. I look forward to continuing to work on both things that I think that we have some reasonable compromise that we come to agreement and keep working on the tough issues also. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Good morning, everyone. Joe Schaefer. I'm a community college employee by day and here representing uh, uh, sportsmen and women of Wyoming from, from Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming. Uh, Rusty, I've also enjoyed becoming an expert in all things, and it's amazing what people will approach me with from uh, trail camera questions to mountain lion distribution to beaver habitat and things like that. And so so um, it's, it's been interesting to see just what's on people's mind. You know, when it comes to these issues before us, one thing that's become pretty clear to me is, is those who are expressing their voice. I don't think we are going to find consensus uh, on any of these issues. And one of the biggest challenges I've found is um, that people are generally, my wife tells me, don't say irrational. They're non-rational when it comes to some of these issues because they're so emotionally <laughs> invested in their love for the outdoors that they tend to interpret information that, that supports their perspective. And so I think that puts a broader pressure on this group to do the best we can to try to keep those biases and that irrationality at bay and actually advance recommendations uh, based on, on what evidence and, and, and what information we have at our hands. I'm with uh, Senator Hicks. We, we, you know, my biggest hope is that we continue to push things and get things out for feedback. Um, you know, we, we can process a lot of this, and I know they're complex issues, but we've got to start getting some stuff done. So I'm anxious to see some things moving forward. I'm appreciative of the subcommittee on the landowner um, issue and, and getting some things out there. I hope we can create a few more subcommittees and try to get some more stuff moving before our next meeting. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Cy Gillen, you represent the outfit industry and lifelong sportsmen. Um, I, you know, I'd really echo what Larry said too, is, is that uh, we need to get some of these things across the finish line so that during the next legislative session, we have uh, significantly more things I hope that need to go in front of the legislature to have a track record of uh, credibility with the legislators and, and uh, some wins this session. So I, I know the operating industry will be in Cheyenne and uh, working on these various, especially the 9010 for the big five. So 
we intend on being there. Um, I would also echo the comment thing, and I think it's really important for resident sportsmen, resident landowners to not be afraid to reach out to uh, myself or anybody that they may consider is not necessarily their representative, because these, these decisions that we're making and, and the comments that we're taking, uh, they have to be blended and everybody on the task force has to hear what what people say. We can't live in a bubble. Just, just, I can't just hear what outfitters have to say because that's not that's not right. I need to hear from resident sports. But so far, I haven't heard from very many. There's a few uh, that have reached out, but most of them haven't. So I, I want to hear what they have to say. I can't just listen to the outfitters. I got to hear everything. So anyway, onward and upward. Okay, <clears throat> Good morning, Elisa Rockle, um, small business owner, um, represent. I guess I don't like the word non-consumptive because I, I consume a lot of our resources. I just don't eat them. Um, <laughs> um, um, very much. Um, I'm grateful for conversations, uh, especially with landowners. What I what I'm most grateful for is those conversations may start on a particular topic, um, but then I have questions and and the, the things I am able to learn. From others, I'm very grateful for. Um, they are very complicated issues. I just when I think I have my brain wrapped around it a little bit, I'll have a conversation with the landowner, and wow, there's so much I was not aware of. Um, so I'm really grateful for those conversations. Um, as far as feedback, primarily, I mean a lot of landowner conversations and their concerns, challenges with changing the qualifying acreage. Um, so hopefully we'll have some discussions about that today. Um, and kind of the why behind our reasoning, I think. You know, um, just in the, in the business that I'm in, a lot of times we might document, right, you know, recommendations or changes that are being made. But unless we have the why, that you know, and what the decision making process was, and why we came to that decision, um, that provides a lot of insight. Not only right now, three years, four years, five years from now. Um, so I think that's important. And my hope, echoing what others have said, is that we really focus on our purpose and the things that we are tasked with and, and not take on some of those issues that, that aren't ours to live. So, yeah, I'm great to be here. Uh, Dwayne Hagen, landowner from um, TC. I guess I'd, I'd like to tell a little story that I hope everybody kind of gets in their mind as we go. Uh, with our decisions and stuff, but I, about a year ago, I had a, a young boy um, from, from the Powell area that uh, uh, was extremely uh, ill with cancer. Uh, and I'm affiliated with the Outdoor Dream Foundation. And they called and wanted to know if I, he wanted to go on a lion hunt. So uh, the conditions weren't, we didn't have any snow. But he still wanted to go in, and he was very sick. Anyway, uh, he had a great time. We, you know, you could just tell he was enjoying himself just being out. I didn't think I'd ever see the little, little boy again. A young man. So this past weekend, they called and said uh, he'd like to go back on that. Lion. Been in the hospital for a year. Had his leg amputated and half of his crutch several months ago. Still came, wanted to go out. It was a challenge just getting in there. Uh, again, we didn't have any snow. So we looked for a track, but we weren't able to do it. But just uh, being with that boy and seeing his will. And how much he enjoys the outdoors and hunting and fishing. He still has I mean, he just saw this kid. Just a look on his face, you could just tell. And when, he's, uh, when he left, his, his grandpa was with him and his mom. And uh, his grandpa said, I haven't seen that look on his face for a long time. And he missed his senior year. So he's going to, I think, through Northwest, some kind of a program, he's going to try to finish his senior year and get his diploma. But I, what really um, 
I've been involved with the Outdoor Dream since its inception in about almost 20 years. And it's stories like this that has really been the difference for me. And, and so I guess I'm going to applaud the ranchers and landowners and outfitters in Wyoming because of, of any state, they have produced more hunting opportunities for these kids by far than, than any other state. So I want to applaud the landowners and, and outfitters in the state. I might pull of the challenge you face in, in balancing both focusing on what's possible and also doing the hard stuff, recognizing all of your issues are the hard stuff, mm -hmm. thinking about joint story and the, the difficulty of reaching consensus that some of you have articulated and how diverse the opinions are. I hope that passion for the power of wilderness and wildlife um, you know, helps us to find the right balance in these things, right? <clears throat> there aren't easy answers, hopefully in that shared passion that we have we can find the best way to distribute and, and I don't say divide up, um, but how we can best share and, and share as we nurture this resource. So, Rusty, you want to add something? Before no, we... Carrie, I just want to make sure we introduce people. Oh, yeah. Online. Our folks are online. Thank you. Um, I think we've got three folks online, and apologies, we've got um, a different meeting format today that might make it a little bit more clunky. Um, can we, Todd, do I need to do it on this computer, or can you do it back there so we can have... Um, I can do it here just uh, like uh, Jamie and Brian. I think we've got Jamie, Lisa, and um, Jen online. Okay, Jamie? I think that's Jamie's out here. Jamie, can you? I think you're unmuted. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Jamie Flitner, uh, oh. legislator. Can you hear me? Hang on, Jamie, we can't hear you. Okay. I think I'm hearing that. Is the, I'm not sure if the audio is coming out of the big speaker or if it's just the, I'll take off my Britney Spears. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Hello. It's amazing how helpless the rest of us are. I don't know how to deal with the feedback. <laughs> if we mute, this one is muted. If we mute ourselves in the room, that mute whatever is taking the audio from here, but keep the volume up for Jamie. <laughs> Any thoughts? No. I guess my, you know, not that we don't want to hear from the task force members, but um, I want to be able to be able to take public comments on here so we can maybe try to work it out. You know, at some point during your day, that'd be helpful. Um, all right, so folks that are online, um, we will try to work out the technical side on our end. Uh, maybe we might need to, if we need to change the meeting setup, um, we'll do that and send out a new link and post it to the website. So if folks are watching now, um, we might have to set up, I think, <coughs> a new format to make it work a little better. Um, you might throw an email address out so if somebody has a comment or question, yeah. They can chat. Yeah, they they can, they can type it in the chat as it is right now. So, um, 
Lisa, Lisa says just say hi to me and hello for me as well. Okay, <laughs> so we're we're getting the hellos from our folks online, um, and we'll figure out um, the technical side. Uh, let's jump in then. Um, if there's no oh, um, just remind us of our norms before we jump into the rest of the agenda. Um, these were thoughtfully created at the beginning of the task force, and I don't expect any bad behavior for these. Um, but I was thinking in your in your introductions and um, saw your comment about kind of listening to all those perspectives. Um, really struck on this this maintaining openness to new ideas and thoughtful, respective, respectful exchange of them. I think that's been a strength of the task force, and especially as we jump into the the hard stuff. Um, I think that's going to just continue to be more and more important. Um, acknowledging those differences and, and staying open to them, um, trying to find that perfect balance. So just remind us of those. Um, all right, legislative update. Sure. Are we ready to come into that? Yeah. yeah. So um, where we're at right now with the uh, the 9010 Big Five and Once in a Lifetime bill, it's a committee bill coming out of TRW. Um, that TRW met yesterday, but this bill was not on the agenda. Um, and so we didn't speak on this. Um, and what this if, if it passed, it's it's a committee bill, but there was an amendment to put on it. Um, an amendment passed in, in in a five four fashion to add uh, the governor's licenses uh, and include those ninety ten and once in a lifetime also. So um, it's it's the intent to go to the committee talking with the chair the chairwoman. Um, that during during session, when that bill goes to committee, we will speak on that bill. Um, hopefully, we can have a good turnout for that. We don't know when that's going to be. That's the way it works. We'll find out, you know, a day before, or two days before, um, and we will um, offer that that amendment. From my understanding, talking to the committee members um, here, that we would offer that amendment to try to be taken out of that bill, and and really. The reason why is this committee hasn't talked about set aside licenses. We haven't discussed that. Um, that was something that that was added um, um, in addition to what we did talk about, which was the 9010 and once in a lifetime. That is in the bill. That is, a, in my opinion, that is a good bill. Um, the part, the amendment that was put in, in my opinion, um, I don't really want to talk about my opinion as much as that. But the, but this committee, this task force, never talked about. Whether that's a good amendment or a bad amendment, it wasn't part of what this task force talked about. Um, I think that has some ramifications. Um, not, I don't want to say that legislators can't don't have a better idea and can't amend <coughs> our bill, but that's a whole separate issue that was added to this, um, and I want to make sure that we we address that. Um, I would like, uh, you know, especially legislators on this for help and and guidance on how best to do that and. Um, you know, I, I think I have a pretty good handle on it, but I, but I think um, the more uh, the more conversation we have on that, the better. Um, the more conversation with that committee and with those members that voted for that, that, that maybe um, have a different understanding. Maybe uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I get your get your take on that, but that's that's the that's the game plan um, for that. Go ahead, Josh. Brian, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I know you gave the DRW committee an update on the task force effort with this bill. Um, do you have anything you can offer as how you thought this came to be and how there is those opportunities where you can see something be shaped and reshaped and completely lose its original intent and form in this process? Yeah, there was actually there was one member of the committee that um, through the discussion about you know once in a lifetime that whole the whole concept of you know a person can only get one of these in a lifetime um he, he brought up governor's licenses and that spurred a whole other discussion and you know at the end of the at the end of the discussion his amendment i think there were three other folks in the room that were supportive of the amendment initially um you know, I presented some information on what the task force discussed and the fact that we hadn't talked about it and the fact that <coughs> there was some real issues. It was a it was a big deal to make that kind of a change. And at the end of the day, you know, they, they, they passed the amendment. I don't know um, what Representative Flitner thinks about the druthers of the rest of the committee and if we brought this back up, what they would think. But, you know, just one thing I'd throw out there is, is maybe 
it would be informative for TRW to know that this issue came back to the task force. We discussed it. And at the end of the day, the task force said, yeah, it's good or no, it's bad. You know, that probably could help when we went back down during the regular session to to discuss the bill again. And I don't know, if, are there legislators in the room agree with that or? I think that's critical. You know, the task force, you know, on this bill and it's <clears> critical <throat> that they make their views known. Uh, the other thing is the committee's not the final answer. It can get changed again down the road. This is not a, a, a normal process. And it's very normal to have a bill come out that doesn't look exactly like you want it to start. That is a normal process. Uh, there's 90 people down there that have been in, they're good at doing what they do. You may get a part of what you want, but not all. And that is that is not unusual. But the best way to get what you want is to be very clear about what you expect and what you want. So I would hope that we do the debate in this committee and that arms our Jamie, myself, Larry for floor debates said, look, we did large statewide polling and this was the consensus the committee came up with because it really is different than opinion. I look around the table, I'm looking next door to me and Lee and you guys are all lobbying me. You've seen what bills can do. We've run outfitter bills back and forth. And I've been on both sides with them. I can tell you, you don't know until the governor signs the bill really what you got. And that's don't be disappointed if something changes. Take take what you consider a win, and if it gets where it's poisonous, make sure you let people know. Because so sometimes, sadly enough, you have to kill something rather than have something bad go forward. And I really do think the committee will listen somewhat to you, and I'll guarantee you the floor will. And then, let me. Can I clarify, um, Brian and Ogden? Are you suggesting that we? Um, that the task force needs to take a stand on the this issue of set aside licenses um, specifically to help inform that discussion. Um, I, I thought we were leaning in the way of just we didn't talk about that. That wasn't our idea. But it sounds like it might be more fruitful to say, okay, we did talk about it, and this is what we. So we don't have to necessarily do it. We can say, look, we don't think it's part of this bill. Okay. You know, I, if you don't want to go down that path, that's fine. But it is appropriate to say. If you're not, is we don't think it's appropriate for the bill, or it is appropriate for the bill, and it, it will have a, a, a way on it. This this committee, folks, is closer to the people in the legislature, as I hate to be really rude, but that's we're specifically here for this cause, and you're going to get extra weight for it if you represent it correctly. So, you know, my end of it, we take out of the committee. I think Albert will tell you the same. Larry will. We're going to pack the water as committee as best we can, or at least I am. That's that's why I'm here. And even if it's something I don't 100 percent be there, I think the committee's done it as best it can to come up with the best solution. So, oh, Albert, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I, I and I talked to Rusty about the process. You know, I think you try to get a change in the committee in session, and uh, then it's a standing committee, and then the, and, and then the body kind of knows where it's at. And I think, you know, I think all of us that's in the legislature will represent the task force views to the legislature. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that I'm going to vote for bills. You know, I represent, I don't represent you all. I represent Silver County. And I'll vote however my conscience determines me to vote. And, and, uh, and then, you know, full disclosure, I'm developing two wildlife bills right now. And, and I'm likely going to mark them up, you know, put them up on the board. And uh, they're not, they're not, uh, one's very uncontroversial. The other one I'm going to probably number just because it is controversial. So where does the group want to go from here? It sounds like we can say, um, we can give feedback to the committee to say this is not part of the bill. Or we can weigh in and say, all right, we've discussed this and this is what we think about that topic. Because you think about the other things you want to discuss. Let's think about if that if the set aside license is something we want to raise to discuss now or just give that feedback. It's not part of the bill. We <laughs> set it aside and, and tackle it separately. Adam, what did you want to? Well, and this may just be another wrinkle thrown in with the idea of governor's licenses being once in a lifetime, but we also have the Wyoming Super Tag sort of <coughs> saying. You know, how, where does that apply? Can you no longer buy a rapid ticket for 
sheep license if you're either through one, bought one, or were lucky enough to win a super tag raffle. And I don't know if that's a necessary wrinkle, but it was something that was brought up to me by someone who's a very passionate sheep hunter. That, you know, he's already against the once in a lifetime side of things, but they said, Are you telling me I can't? Spend more money on a raffle ticket for a super tag if I've already drawn a sheet tag, or so I don't know if that's a wrinkle that needs to be discussed as well. Uh, as a, you know, because I, I look at the governor's license, you're talking about such a, a deep checkbook that that does not affect the vast majority of people. And if we're looking at 90 10 for a governor's license, the number of residents that are buying that governor's license, I mean, I don't know the numbers on that, but just anecdotally, it's not residents that are buying that license, so. And I think it ends the non I'm sorry, I'll let somebody else go. I got so lost. I just I saw a hand from Larry. <laughs> I don't know what else. <laughs> well, I, I would just tell you, I think Albert's right at the end of the day. <clears throat> you know, you got 90 different members down there that represent different districts. Uh, some districts have different demographics. And at the end of the day, those are the people that are going to vote. Specific regards to the recommendation that this comes out of the committee. It doesn't do, in my opinion, any good to come back and say, well, the committee doesn't want that to do. If we're going to do that, we need to provide a rational explanation as to why it should be. The rational explanation, in my mind, is not that the committee didn't take it up. The set aside licenses is a whole big category all at sale. And if you start pulling this string, it's going to impact this string. I think Adam just talked about it. Pretty soon you're into the, the super tags and all these other issues. So you need to be very careful when we go in here and you start changing one thing that has implications to a whole bunch of other things. If this committee was so inclined to take up set aside tags at some point in time, that's a whole big issue that needs to be explored before you do an amendment that hasn't gone through a robust discussion and understanding all the nuanced effects of incorporating that amendment to that. Now, if we send that back to the committee and explain that's why we think that should be withdrawn. That's a different discussion than the committee just decided we didn't want it in the bill. And, and, and just, to, just to add on to that, that's what I talked to with, with Chairman Flitner was that this 9010 once in a lifetime bill was passed unanimously mm -hmm. with this committee and we think that the bill is a good bill but the other part of it um the, the amendment that was put in was not discussed it wasn't because it's not on our agenda it wasn't it, we just haven't and that the set aside licenses is a different it is a different animal yeah. it's not just governor's tags it's not it's commission tags it's other set asides it's a whole different different animal that if they want us to you know if, if so inclined we can talk about those i have yeah. no problem with that but i think just letting that committee know that this amendment um has some has some ramifications probably outside of what it actually does mm -hmm. um it, it gets into a lot of money for wildlife management projects that if they don't i don't think they understand <laughs> through, the, through the governor's big game license coalition and, the, and i think that, it, that that the committee just didn't that they didn't understand that this, that, that the <laughs> domino effect of what it could happen. Right. And, and so, you know, if, if we want to ask them to um, talk about set aside licenses in the interim, fine. If they want us to talk, if we want to take that up at some point in the next nine to 10 months, perfectly fine. I have no problem putting that in the agenda. But I think adding that to a bill that was, that, that was, that was unanimously pushed forward um, sometimes an amendment like that kills the whole bill, and I don't think that's the intent of this committee either. And and I realize, I think we all realize that bills, it's a sausage banking process, and there might be some things that are added or or maybe it's phased in, but ultimately that the 90, 10, once in a lifetime was was discussed for months and months and hundreds of hours and hundreds <laughs> of public comments. And I think it's something that, that we won't want to push forward, but um, trying as, as much as we can to take that amendment out I think is is important for this going forward and we'll talk about maybe we can talk about set aside licenses in the future okay. and i think though i think there'll be some pretty good success in getting that amendment i mean it, it really is two different issues yeah and i think the legislature will see that it's very it's two different completely different ideas yeah. one day. okay okay so i'm hearing some some rationale to say please don't include it and this is why it's it's complex there's other implications and effects of it 
keep it separate and and um, that's something we can discuss Lee, you've been waiting and then i see brian no, I, I, we can get way off in the weeds on this i think i agree 100 percent with senator hicks i think would be i would suggest that either you he or using what he's saying we've come up with a position statement from this from this uh from this committee to forward to the trw committee and at the same time again show up show up down there in cheyenne you know i've done it size done it there's quite a few of us that have done it and, and they're not unapproachable Hicks, i mean uh Ogden is sometimes they'll go hide but they're not unapproachable they're not they're not it's not you know they're not up on this pedestal and you can't talk to them you can grab them in the hall and say hey this is what, like what i'm thinking you can sit down there in those in those committee meetings and you will be if you want to be your voice heard you will be heard you go up there and address the committee so but i i believe the position statement along the lines of what larry's saying is is not that we just don't like it but this is this is why that would be a, that would be my suggestion um thank you lee brian what did you want to add well this i think complements what senator hicks said and i think that we will be yeah. Um, more successful if there's strong justification for why task force um, wasn't particularly keen on doing this issue melded together with with the bill that's already been presented. And, and certainly the complication is part of it, but the underlying philosophy that has been adopted by the legislature in the past is I think what we need to say, yes, we agree with that or no, we don't. The, the underlying philosophy of the of law Wyoming a lot at this point has been that the bulk of the licenses, um, which are what we addressed with that bill, were to provide hunting opportunity and manage wildlife. And then there's been this group of, of other licenses that have been specifically identified for revenue generation um, to, to take a very small number of licenses and raise a whole lot of money. That's what the super tag's there for. That's what the governor's licenses have been used for for the last um, three governors anyway. Um, and that's what commissioner licenses have been used for. And so if we go down and say, you know, the committee felt like that's a good, that's a, it's a good idea to continue that model. I, I think that helps the justification. If we go down and say the committee um, thinks that maybe we ought to um, go a different direction, but we think we ought to do it separately. I think that's something that could be argued. The, the argument on the other side of this is from the bringer of the amendment was that it's just not fair. We're talking about everyday Joe only gets one, License, one sheep license as an example in a lifetime. Um, why does the rich guy get to buy five? Because he can afford a governor's license. That's the argument that was brought on the other side of this thing. So I just throw that out if the committee even wants to take up something like that to decide whether we should um, use that as part of the justification. Um, I'm wondering, it's sounding like there's agreement that we want that issue to be separate a separate topic that we don't want that amend to be included in the bill uh, i'm trying to just quickly draft up some language that somebody else could wordsmith later um and knowing that that rusty can and the rest of you can kind of bring that message forward i don't want to do all that wordsmithing now um but if we were to get some bullet points it's something along the lines of what i'm starting with here the task force acknowledges the important topic of set aside licenses i.e governor's tags, blah, blah, blah. We can articulate what those are. Given this, the topic demands further study before moving forward. The task force recommends advancing the bill with a narrow focus on broad license distribution, thinking about the 90-10 change and what would you call once in a lifetime? Limitations. And limitations, lifetime limitations. I think that's probably enough for a, to capture a particular word Okay. Yeah, I think so, so. so these topics received um, deep attention, <laughs> thorough study, <laughs> um, something okay. along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can craft something from that. Something along those lines. That I, I think that's good. And so then the next the next item on the legislative uh, update would be had some questions on why isn't the preference point change that we had moved forward uh, uh, moving that system <laughs> from a preference point to a weighted bonus point why isn't that added in the bill that was that was in the, that was after the fact it was something that we decided was going to go to the interim committee and I have a draft I have a draft of that that language that Pat sent to me that we are going to take to the 
to the legislature and have that discussed as an interim committee, but that's why this is this doesn't contain that language. Um, and and so it's it's the draft that um, that moves that and four years after the date of the legislature passed. Now I feel like having this conversation in the interim, um, those dates, those times probably going to get stretched. They're going to get talked about a lot. There's going to be a lot more public comment on that. Uh, I think that also brings up the fact that some of the comment that we got on this um, was not totally understood that we had literally hours of conversation on how do we, um, how do we work on people that are going to probably draw in the next so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we, we talked in length about addressing that, 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 that language is going to be taken to as an interim topic. So, or at least asked to be as an interim topic. So that's where, that's where that preference points moving to a weighted bonus point language is right now. Oh, did you have a hand on that? Yeah. I Back to the bills. I think it's critical you don't vote up a ma major bill on this. If you do a of bills, and that falls back in your comments on the last one. It's as concise as you can and as tight as you can. If you put these big bills, you'll lose votes just because one person doesn't like one piece of it. So put, put one issue in a bill and don't worry about having five bills or six bills. They're, you're going to go through the same fights regardless if they're all in one. <laughs> The only difference is if you got six issues in the bill, you're liable to lose a whole pile of votes because you've got one thing that's supposed to fill in there, and these are all contentious issues. Okay. Yep. So, to me, keep them really tight, run them in bills. <laughs> you need to do interim on them, do interim on them, but don't don't make these bills try to be all inclusive because when you do, you lose support all the way across the board as you do it. You'll get someone to come in. You also draw amendments. Uh, this amendment that's already on there, you're going to see other amendments yep. get drawn because of it. Someone's going to include the one-shot antelope hunt tags, so or they're going to include another set in it. And so the cleaner you can have them, and I think we can explain that to the body, the better off you are. Okay. If you hate set-aside tags, run a bill to get rid of them. Right. But don't try to bury them in another bill somewhere. Okay. So I, I really wouldn't put anything in a people ask. Yeah, there'll be more come, but yeah. we're not going to run one big bill. Okay. Appreciate that wisdom from the sausage making. <laughs> That's good, good to know. Another comment on that? Yeah, just, just to follow up with the other proposed recommendation that come out of here and going into the interim process, that, that will have to be shepherded by members of this again through that. And the reason is, is they will not, they do not have the time to build into all the issues. I mean, if you look at the statistical analysis, the El Triple C run and all of that stuff, and the amount of public comment, that committee is just not going to have the time to dive into this in depth. And so if we make a recommendation back to my earlier comment, we need to shepherd that through the process because it's arguably that there's much more expertise and knowledge on this task force than there is broadly on the TRW. That, that covers everything from tourism to gambling to everything out there. So there's way more expertise, there's way more background knowledge on it. So my concern is, as we kick this into a, an interim topic, it's very easy to get one or two, three people that are very persuasive to come in and push a position on that committee because they just don't know folks. They don't have the, the, the in-depth knowledge and the, the discussions and the study of the topic like we have. So we have a responsibility to also shepherd that bill <coughs> recommendation through that interim process too. So I, I would anticipate there's going to be a little bit more work for maybe the chairman and a few Member, many members that would volunteer to help go to those TRW committees when this is on the agenda to boy up the recommendation that this task force has made. So uh, just my suggestion is that process moves forward into the next year. Um, can we process-wise then, um, can we count on Rusty to kind of be our representative and speaking to the committee, but with, with communication, Hey, to show up, folks, this is the time. Yeah, and then I think an open invitation from the rest of the committee to, to, to do that, too. I, I That's much appreciated. Yeah, and and will you just be in touch with folks when those dates are getting set? I'm just thinking about everybody in their daily lives um, not knowing when those dates are or how they can best show up. If you can kind of move the on that way so that, that folks can show up if they're available or, or lend their support. Um, we'll see you at a... Yeah, good. Yeah.
point that lets all of us know right. when and where. Yeah, that way you're not all <laughs> having to remember amidst your lives to check the calendar to find out. Joe? So a couple of quick questions. First one, I think, so, so I'm assuming, Brian, that, that the sequencing of this, the shift with the current bill and then picking up the the preference point issue and in interim is okay from a department's perspective. We can implement it sort of in stages like that. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Rusty, I guess, and Josh, the other question is, do you want a formal motion and a vote by the task force to advance that record? Would that help you or not? Or are you okay with just taking consensus? Uh, I'm okay with taking consensus. Oh, yeah. no, I don't, I, don't, I yeah. I, we, we've passed, we voted. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we already voted on this. Topic. Yeah, there was there was great agreement on the topic, and then it's just how do you deal with the unexpected that comes back from the legislature. Okay. So the, the last thing made this for the parking lot. Eventually, it would. I mean, uh, Representative Summers' comment really made me think about when 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 legislature convenes and we show up there. It'd be helpful for me to understand what are what are my parameters, what are our parameters for communication, and just generally, I think communicating from the task force mm -hmm. might be something we want to talk about as we yeah. get in there. Because because yeah. I mean, some of us will have that you know, we're there, we'll have the ability to say you know, represent certain things. But, yeah, good. Um, a lot of the groups I work with, they um, will work at the end of a meeting to say what's our message out, right, or what what's the, the flag that we're bearing um, collectively from this. Um, I don't know that this group necessarily needs that level of cohesion and agreement, um, but the, if, if we have said we support this, um, that we have the task force blessing to represent the traffic task force and conveying those conversations. So um, we can talk about that in the next steps, how we can how we can represent the task force in that way. Is that? Uh, yeah, sort, sort of. I guess. So, go ahead. I'm wondering about the the ethical obligations to the task force versus you know. For, for, for me, I mean, I guess being, being elected as an official is something a little bit different, mm -hmm. but representing landowners or not landowners, sportsmen, mm -hmm. you know, so so Adam and I show up in Cheyenne and we do everything to lobby the hell out of them to basically unwind the recommendations of the task force. There's mm -hmm. this, this ethical obligation as a member of the task force, I guess I'm struggling with here. Yeah, I think when, when I think back to our June meeting and we said, if you support something, if you put up your green card or your thumb or you vote yay, <laughs> right, that 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 is an indication to the group that is your will and you will support it. Um, and if you and if you don't, that you do the work in the room and you voice that, but that once you've agreed to something in here, that there's a certain commitment to honor that. Am I remembering that correctly? Or maybe that that's simple enjoy the consistency yeah. with our vote is Yeah, up. yeah. That that if you if you give your green card or your thumbs up in here that you are indicating, even if I think this idea is imperfect, I support it. It's the, the best thinking that we have and I will support it and speak to that publicly. And if you don't, if you're going to be <laughs> saying, I don't like this, I think it's a bad idea publicly, then you let the group know that so the group is aware of that and that, that we would expect alignment between, between those things. Just maybe this one will be out, Joe. I, I do spend a fair amount of time down in Cheyenne and I, I, ha I make it very clear when I'm testifying because I'm a county commissioner, I'm also a member of the State Board of Outfitters and I'm also an outfitter member, outfitter member of Wyoga, but I make it very clear who, what, what position I'm testifying in. And, and if, and as far as a county commissioner, our association asks that if we advance something that this association supports, we go in and lobby it. But if we are going to lobby against it personally, then we just give them a heads up because there might be issues that come out of this committee that you or Cy or anybody else can't support on a personal level. And you might feel that you need to lobby against it. you in all, you know, in a good conscience, you need to lobby against it. But it's just it's just nice to let the committee know ahead of time that, hey, I know that the committee advanced this and we support it as a committee, but I'm going to go and and so it just doesn't come out of left field for the rest of the committee members that that one of our members is lobbying against it. And everyone has that right, you know, in that in that front of those legislators is to voice their personal opinion, but just let them know that, hey, I'm, I'm here as a, as John Q citizen, but also at the same time, let the committee know where you're going to be coming down. Mm -hmm. that's and and the that's the place. Of the legislators. Yeah, the legislator, legislators have to have a completely free reign because they yep. represent a district. Mm -hmm. And I would just encourage them to voice that perspective in the room too, right? Because in wearing that hat, this group needs to be aware of that hat too. Um, so we, we're always happy to hear that that representation. Uh, yeah, and I'll talk to that in a minute. But 
So back to the interim topic thing, one thing is, is, is Senator Hicks and, and Ogden and I are all going to be a part of the group that decides what is an interim topic. So one thing I think you should think about is, do we want that, that specific or should the interim topic be, maybe this is a couple of us, but should it just be task force, the wildlife task force? And then that opens it up. If there's some other idea that comes up that you want to bring forward to that committee next year, you're not tied down to one specific item. And so that, that might be the way to approach that as the interim topic is actually a long More broad task. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, yeah, I do too. And then on, you know, just so you all know, I will always, even if I disagree with you with, with this on the floor or with you guys on the floor, I will always represent what the task force says is case before I give my opinion. I'll say the task force said this, but I think it's this way. <laughs> that's that's just what you know I'm gonna I'll be I'll represent you all. I'm just not you're not my constituents. Yeah. And and just remember in that the the, the task force will be served by you voicing your opposition and I have no doubt that you will. <laughs> but that you'll voice the, the opposition to the task force as well so they can wrestle with it and, and perhaps appease it um, so that they're not surprised. Um, if that opposition comes well, out. And, and uh, just quickly on that, let's be honest. Um, this We get more and more input from our constituents mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. and all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And things are not always going to stay the same out mm -hmm. here for what, for what you hear from your vote. Yeah, yeah. Good. I just need to add one more point. Just because this task force recommends that the TRW committee take this up doesn't mean it would be assigned to the committee as a study topic. We have our own legislative processes that this could be a recommendation. Those chairman or anybody can bring this to the committee. So first thing is the committee will then sit down and see if they want to take it up. You know, they may or may not. And then even if they decide to take it up, given based on the workload, the number of days and other priority issues, that then goes to management council, that's more of an elected leadership body of legislators that then will assign those topics. So there's no guarantee, even if this task force, I think it has a high probability, but I just want to lay out that, that, that don't just assume that we make a recommendation that it's even going to be an interim topic. It's in the process, it has a high probability given the nature of the task force recommendation. But we may get saddled with the TRW. They're right in the middle of all this gaming issue that could literally eat up a whole bunch of their time. And it may be to the people that are not infinitely aware of the task force. It could be the management council come back and say, we just don't think that that's a priority use of that committee's time, given all the other right. things that are going on. So it's just that. understanding of the process again and the way it will flow. I don't have any expectations that it won't, but again, I don't can't prognosticate on what the future is yeah. going to look like and what those issues are three or four months from now. Thanks for that, Larry. Um, I'm mindful of wanting to get to our um, next couple topics here real quick, but um, Josh, you have one more comment on this. Yeah, I just, Joe, I, and I'm glad you brought it up because at, up to this point, I think we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have really grabbed the low hanging fruit and we've had a lot of unanimous efforts to move forward the recommendations that we have put forward but I, I think if we look at the issues that we have now in front of us it's a slim probability that we'll have that type of favor on some of these issues and, and there will be some division within the task force that being said there still can be a recommendation being pushed forward with a, a 10 to 8 vote being over 50 percent and that does put you in a position of I was adamantly opposed to that, but the task force did move this forward with the majority. So I think it's important that you clarified that and wanted to know how, how do we move as a task force, especially in that process within the legislature, to, to be able to speak in favor or opposing that. Mm -hmm. So It's a good call, too, of, of knowing how... Um, modified things might get in the in the later sausage making the higher level of agreement the, the better thinking we can do the greater consensus we can reach within a group you can avoid some of those awkward positions and have a better chance of it going forward but being realistic that when that level of agreement isn't there we can still make a recommendation if we meeting that threshold so um all right let's jump in um we we have a quick update on the WISAC survey i think either brian or rick 
Please do just let us know the latest. Yeah, Rick. Rick's been working on a set of questions. Okay. Um, to run by the group. Okay. Um, but he doesn't have that done. Yet, so okay. So in, maybe in our March meeting or email Probably in February. Between now and then. We'll okay. Push that. Great. So stay tuned if you remember. Um, YSAC is the sophisticated surveying. They have more sophisticated surveying capabilities as far as um, sampling. So they're working on a, a set of questions that will um, provide some rich information to the task force. So it sounds like between now and our March meeting, um, you'll get a draft copy of those questions. And will folks just be able to email feedback? Of yeah, I wouldn't even say they're draft questions. They'll be ideas or examples of what could be asked for the group to weigh in on. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks. Anything else on that topic? All right. Um, so our next agenda topic is getting um, new information around issues two and three. So this is responding to questions that you all had last time. Um, I think Scott is going to talk about damage. Um, do we want to take a quick break before that, or do we want to jump right in? Let's just jump right in. <laughs> Scott, how fresh do you want it? Come on up. It sounds like folks are okay to to continue, um, and uh, after these presentations, perhaps we'll take a break then um, and come back refreshed to wrestle with possible solutions. Of course, it's your timer like this. I don't know if you guys yeah. know. <laughs> if these stays on the course, or, yeah. So what do I need here? What do you need? I don't know. I can speak pretty loud. So <laughs> do you want the microphone? Yeah, I'd rather not. Okay. Well, Carrie, I just want to make sure the audience can hear Scott, so yeah, if they can't hear him. Folks well, in the back, how you... Could you give us a sample of your one? <laughs> I'm here to give you guys everything you wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask about why. <laughs> <laughs> Folks in the back, you okay? Yeah, all right. If, if you start flagging, they will wave you down and ask you to speak louder. <laughs> so how do we, is, is someone with the presentation for me? Or do I know this? Oh, okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, who don't, don't, know, don't know me, my name is Scott Edberg. I'm a, Deputy Chief of Wildlife, the Deputy Chief Game Board for about another week. Um, I've got a 31 year uh, year career with the department and I'll be turning in my green truck, red shirt, gold badge and duty belt on um, February 2nd. It's been a great run and it's gonna be missed. Um, the last 11 years, thank you. Uh, the last almost 11 years, I've had the distinct opportunity to oversee the department's uh, damage program. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here today is give everybody an overview of our, our statutes and rates which oversee or dictate or direct whatever you want to use our, our damage program. And then at the end, I'll get into some specific figures um, for FY21 um, on some, uh, like I said, just some specific damage claim figures about how many claims we have, what it costs the department, some specific species damage. So uh, with that, sir, can we fire up the PowerPoint? All right, one thing, a lot of these slides have a lot of text. I'm not gonna read them, you all can read, and maybe you've done some homework when you got this and looked at it, but I'll try to hit the, the highlights as we go through this. So, damage statutes and regulations, um, Wyoming statute under Title 23, specifically 231901 is the statute that directs the commission and department to address wildlife damage. Um, and that further defines that the commission will develop and implement a damage regulation, which currently is our chapter 28 damage regulation. And that covers damage for big and trophy game, game birds, um, big game animals, and gray wolf. And gray wolves are, gray wolf is unique in the fact that we only cover for damage whether they're classified as a trophy game animal or in direct adjacent properties, uh, landowners who are in the trophy zone, but they also have property in the predator zone. So again, we pay for big game animals, trophy game animals, gray wolves, and game birds. And we started our damage compensation program in 1939, and we've had it consistently since then. As you can imagine, since 1939, there's been a lot of changes, revisions in statute and in Chapter 28 regulations. Okay. All right, this is the actual statute. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to hit some of the high points. Um, anybody who's uh, who's uh, suffering or, or having wildlife damage needs to notify the district game warden, local commissioner, or damage control warden. We don't have damage control wardens anymore of the damage. Again, that has to be within 15 days of discovery of the damage. Uh, we go out and investigate, and we cover 
uh, very specific damages, and I'll get into those more specifically in another slide. Um, we work with the landowner, uh, claimant, agent of the claimant, agent of the landowner to investigate. And then when the damage is ended, the claimant has 60 days upon the end of damage to submit a, a notarized affidavit outlining what they are requesting for damages. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, after that, if they don't, um, the department investigates, provides a recommendation back to the claimant uh, with a payment amount that is either a full payment or a partial payment or denial. And depending on what that is, the landowner can either accept uh, the department's uh, payment recommendation or they can appeal to the commission. They want to appeal to the commission. You have 30 days to submit that request in writing. And then that appeal is heard at the next regularly scheduled commission meeting. Uh, the commission basically acts as a jury. They hear the claimant side of the damage claim. They hear the department side of the damage claim. And the commission has the ability to uh, approve the department's recommendation, deny the, recommend the department's recommendation, or modify the department's recommendation. After that process, if the claimant still does not accept what the commission offered, we go to arbitration. Arbitration is a legal process, which is overseen by the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, it's a three panel jury of electors in the county where the damage was filed. Uh, the department picks an arbiter. The claimant picks an arbiter. Between those two, they uh, pick a third arbiter. And then they go to arbitration. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a hearing where, again, the department presents its evidence. The claimant presents, pre presents their evidence. And then after that, uh, the arbiter back to the jury and make a recommendation on what they're going to compensate uh, that claimant for. Uh, that kind of ends it unless there is a violation of law in the arbitrator's decision, then it goes to district court. We do have two of those that have been to district court. Uh, one is actually going today. We had one that went a year ago, and the one from a year ago is now was just heard in the Supreme Court a week ago from today. So we do have these going all the way up to the line of the Supreme Court uh, uh, these days. And these are two claimants that basically appeal, arbitrate, and then go to district court for the last couple of years. So it's something we just plan for every year. So next. Um, so again, this is just some more statutory stuff, kind of covered all that. Um, goes out more, talks about where the gray wolf is, is considered a, a, a game animal. Uh, for damages, even in the words that are predatory zone on the adjacent on the adjacent property of landowners who have property in the predator zone, but their property carries over into the predator zone, we will pay for damages there. So next, please. Okay, here again, here's just a recap of what I went over. We've got the big game, trophy game, or gamer. You have to do the 15 days. It's got to be reported by the landowner, least your agent representative of whose property is being damaged. And again, the nearest game warden supervisor, game commission, commission member. Statute actually says damage control board, but we did, like I said, we did away with those back in the mid 90s. And most of the time they go right to their local game warden. Our, our folks uh, in the field have great relationships with landowners and the landowners know directly to call the game warden. And then we kind of just take it over from there and work with the, with the uh, person who's suffering damage. Next. Okay, so what do we uh, pay for? We pay for this is what the statute outlines. We pay for um, livestock or bees, damage or killed by a trophic game animal, damaged land, growing cultivated crops, stored crops, including honey and hives, seed crops, improvements, and extraordinary damage to grass. And we'll get into each one of those a little bit more. Livestock uh, is defined in statute as well. Means horses, mules, and asses, rabbits, llamas, cattle, swine, sheep, goats, poultry, or other animals carefully used for food or the production of food or fiber, and guard animals actively engaged in the protection of livestock. And the bison are considered livestock unless otherwise designated by the Wyoming Livestock Board and the Commission. So those bison are unique in the fact that they have dual classification in the state. Part of the state, they're wildlife. Part of the state, they're uh, livestock. So like in that Jackson Pinedale. Uh, country where they you know, all around Yellowstone, they're all, all considered uh, uh, wildlife there, but there's also domestic livestock uh, bison there as well. And then we are allowed by law to be, uh, establish rules, methods, factors, and formulas to determine the amount of uh, compensation for a landowner that has lost uh, sheep or calves to trophy game animals uh, based on topography and terrain. 
Okay. Again, kind of went over all this stuff about uh, submitting claims, verified claims, and uh, certain things have to be met. It's a simple two-page affidavit that the producer, uh, person claiming damage, fills out. We uh, ask that our field folks work with the uh, claimant in filling out that affidavit so we're all on the same page when it comes time for the department to investigate that, that uh, uh, affidavit and our investigation report that we're kind of in cahoots, realizing at times that is not going to happen, that does not always happen, but it is an expectation that our folks work very closely from the start to the end of a damage claim process with the person claiming damage. Um, after the claim has been submitted, the department has 90 days to complete its investigation report and get back to the claimant with the department's recommendation. If we fail to do that, we have to pay the claim in full along with uh, local interest rates. That has never happened that I'm aware of, and it better never happen. It's not fair for us, it's definitely not fair for the claimants. Next, please. Again, I talked about the appeal process. Um, you can't appeal anything that's a violation of law. So if a claimant doesn't submit their claim or discover the damage within 15 days, um, they can't appeal that. If they don't meet the 60 day submission requirement, they can't appeal that. Um, and so those are the two things that we look at for violation of statute. Now they can appeal uh, things that are in regulation. Um, we have an, actually we have an appeal coming up at the commission meeting, I believe tomorrow. So we have approximately oh, four, five, six appeals a year would result in at least two arbitrations a year. Like I said earlier, then those continue on in the process. And like I said, we just completed a Supreme Court just hearing. A quick question. Week. I'm assuming that most of those appeals are based on depredation or not forage or, or is there a mix? Uh, basically, all of our appeals lately have been in regards to the trophy game and the factors and formulas that are used to determine um, actual losses and, and missing livestock and um, and what so maybe what the definition of some of our livestock classes are. <coughs> Currently, most of them have been livestock claims. And we said there's been two and one individual for the last most of my whole career doing these, and then a, a new player in the last couple of years, and it's all about livestock multipliers. So what's the next? And I talked about this at an appeal, what the commission can do, they can approve, modify, or reverse the department decision. And they do have to, um, they do have flexibility, but they do need to look at and abide by their own regulation when making those recommendations. And then again, if the claimant doesn't like the commission's uh, outcome or decision, um, they have 90 days to request arbitration and they have to do that again within 90 days. It's a pretty long time frame. We, we have had people miss the 90 day time frame by a day or two. Um, when we're done with an, an appeal, I go out and meet with the person, the claimant in the hallway or wherever I can and tell them what's next. And everything is provided to the to the claimant in writing on the commission's decision and what their next steps are. And they're always provided in our correspondence a copy of the statute and regulation. So they're always hopefully up to speed on what the law requires. Next, please. Talked about arbitration. Again, arbitration is run through the Office of Administrative Hearings. That's a state office that does these hearings for state agencies. Our state uh, game and our state attorney general's rep kind of takes the lead. She currently she is our legal counsel. Um, she is our go-between uh, between OAH and the department. Um, once we get arbitration, uh, we have to go find an arbiter. We have to go find an arbiter to represent the department. The claimant has to go find an arbiter for themselves. And then once those two are done, um, they have 20 days to uh, pick a third one. Um, if they don't do that, it's supposed to go to district court. Um, there's been times where the two arbiters really can't come to a decision within the 20 days um, to uh, find that third arbiter. So we've been <laughs> flexible. And at the end of the day, they, they've gone a couple extra days where they've been able to find somebody instead of kicking that over to district court and, and bogging down the process um, even more. So, um, like I said, we, we, they hold the hearing. Um, they're usually about a day. We have two scheduled coming up. We have one in April and one in May, and both of those have been set for two days. Um, the department has to pay the entire cost of the arbitration, the cost of OAH, the cost of a court reporter. Um, cost of any witnesses that we have and then um, if the department um, 
If the, if the claimant through the arbitration process is awarded more or equal to what the, what the um, commission uh, authorized, we pay the bill. The arbiters offer less uh, than what the commission offered. Um, the uh, claimant is supposed to pay at least the arbiters bills. So um, it's always been uh, they pay equal or more than than what the uh, commission offered. So we, we the department's paid the bill basically every time during my, my career. And again, everything is provided um, in writing upon each party, each party what the outcome is. Next. Well, uh, again, if, if there's a if there's a based on the decision of the arbiters, if there's a mistake or violation of law, the court's one statute one B uh, 136, 111, um, file a district court to vacate uh, the decision out of the arbitration board. Um, we did have that happen uh, a year ago where the department took the arbitrator's decision to um, district court in Hot Springs County, but the judge recused herself in Hot Springs County. So went to Judge Simpson in Park County and Judge, Judge, Simpson, Judge Simpson reversed the arbitrator's decision and said, Arbiters are bound uh, by law, which means Title 23 damage statute and commission regulation in their decision. They just can't make a willy-nilly decision outside the sideboards of law. That is the decision that went to before the Supreme Court last Tuesday. Um, and the fact that the claimant's attorney believes that arbiters have the ability to pretty much do whatever they want and aren't bounded by law. So um, we'll see where that shakes out here in another month or so and see what the Supreme Court rules with regards to the role of arbiters in um, making decisions outside of law and they just use use whatever factors, formulas, thoughts, etc. They, they want. Next. Okay, the regulation, this is where you kind of get into the meat and potatoes of our, of our damage program. Um, there's several sections, <clears throat> authority section, definitions, when we get into the damage of livestock where we talk about our multipliers, you have to you have to allow hunting, uh, how you file claims, how we investigate paid claim, claims. Did I do that? No, we just went to sleep. Our computer isn't as hardworking as the rest of you all are. And we break out some more requirements about arbitration, and then we kind of spell out exactly what has to be in a verified claim. So we'll just jump into these. All right, kind of went over this. Uh, this is what the commission is responsible for. Uh, bee, honey, and hives. Um, those get really expensive really fast. Um, but a black, and most of those are about black and grizzly bears, but when they come into a beehive, they spare no mercy. <laughs> they really, pretty much not much left after a uh, beehive uh, and grizzly bear and black bear get together. There's not much left. <clears throat> livestock, again, uh, primarily our damage in livestock is. Um, sheep and, and cattle with most of the cattle being calves veterinary costs again we will cover veterinary costs for, for uh, livestock that's been injured um, and survived but that uh, veterinary cost cannot exceed the value of the livestock at the time of the damage so we're not going to pay ten thousand dollar vet bills for a two thousand dollar year in cattle um extra order to damage the grass that's grass um on the range land uh, most of that is uh, related to elk. You don't get a lot of those claims. Growing cultivated crops, oh, growing cultivated crops, pretty self-explanatory. Rolls be paid for extra uh, side roll. Um, irrigation equipment every year when elk run through them and some fence damage. Seed crops, um, most of that is um, the bighorn basin on alfalfa seed. And then obviously stored crops, again, most of that is stored hay. And most of that is by um, elk, deer. Question. Yes, sir. What's the definition and the rules of extraordinary damage to crops? 50% reductions? Is there extra, a, extraordinary is there damage to grass? What's the definition? Yeah. Long story short is uh, above average use on the on the raven land of the grass species graminate, and we don't have a time period. So if you have 200 elk today, and next year you have 500 elk, that could be potentially an extraordinary damage to grass claim. It's a, above the normal and customary 
uh, number of animals that are present on the field <laughs> and the use of that grass. Does that change over time or year to year? Change, it could change year to year. And we don't get a lot of those claims, to be honest with you. Sorry. Those are incredibly difficult to they are. improve. They are. Yeah. Because if the landowner has 2,000 elk for five years and he never bitches about it, mm -hmm. and then on year six he bitches about it, then he doesn't have a claim. And the problem with that is because we don't have any documentation of what the usual and customary number of elk or uses there. So you're, you're right, that, that is something that is a difficult. So we do pay, we have paid oh, a handful in my tenure. Um, we're actually working on it. We just finished one up or getting close to finishing one up. So, so question on that is, so the baseline is the number of animals, not necessarily what they consume. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. All right, next. Okay, um, definition, we clearly spell out what damage, what damage is, and, and I'm not going to read that as a pretty lengthy definition, but we the key part is we spell out what damage is, and we spell out what damage is not. And the big thing is what it is not. So I'm going to read consequential damage because we do not pay for consequential damage, and that means Damage, loss, or injury that does not flow directly and immediate from the act of the big game animal, trophy game animal, or game bird, or gray wolf, and of course, the farming statute 231901 GNH. Again, that's where it's considered a predatory animal and the wolf can be um, But only from some of the consequences that are results of such acts. Consequential damages include, but are not necessarily limited to future and anticipated production except as otherwise provided in the regulation for the young of your livestock, sentimental value, and labor or equipment costs to remove damaged property. So a couple of good examples are um, the beehive, <laughs> bees get damaged, um, the person has a contract to take their beehives in the winter to California to pollinate um, almond trees or whatever they do. That is a consequential damage. We do not pay for that contract. Um, a calf gets killed. We do in, in, in the summer. We do pay for that price of that calf in the fall because that's when it would normally be marketed. But we would not say, well, that calf would turn into a cow, and over the next ten years we would get calves from that cow. So I want to get paid for those ten calves that got lost because that calf got killed and never was made it to um, cow age. Um, basically, we look at the actual physical, what was physically broken, damaged, injured, whatever. Right there, nothing that's on paper or down the road, if that makes sense. So it's actually what we look at. And you could start going down the uh, anticipated you know, production value, sentimental value and stuff. You know, everybody has a different value on that. So we're very clear that we do not pay for consequential damages. So under consequential damages, would that be a reduction of weight loss on your own cow associated by harassment or say yes. gray wolves outside of the predatory yep. zone? That's very hard. To, that's like nothing. It's very hard to prove and difficult, and, and um, we pay for the value of that actual lost animal, which is injured or or uh, killed. And then improvements. We just talked about what are improvements. Basically, it has to be a structure that improves agricultural land value. And I talked about you know, fences, pivots, um, wind breaks, things like that. But it has to be tied right back to, to livestock agricultural production. Uh, again, those aren't a, those aren't a big expense and. Um, they've mainly been fencing and, and some sidewall pivot sections. Next. Okay. <clears throat> um, claimant calls up, says, I got damaged. Game warden goes out, talks to him, makes a plan on how we're going to evaluate it. Um, at the end of the damage, um, the claimant fills out, a, let's be honest with you, a simple two page affidavit. We have one specific to uh, big game animals and, and game birds, and we have another one specific to uh, trophy game animals. Um, we give them the form. Again, we expect our people to sit down and go over whether we do not fill out the form for them. Um, we will give them our calculations and, and share that information. At least that's the expectation. We have to make sure it's all filled out complete. It has to, it has to be notarized. Um, the department people cannot notarize the affidavit for them. And then they submit it again within that time frame. And every individual person makes a decision whether they're going to file a claim or not. Um, we can't tell a person to file a claim or not file a claim. You can file a claim whatever you want, but it doesn't meet the, the law we're going to deny, obviously. And then, as I said several times, um, they're mailed to the department within 60 days and they all come to our, 
our Casper office and that's based or I'm based out of them where we process all our damage claims out of them. So uh, we don't take them by email. Um, paper thing really works well and I know maybe that's old school, but it's it's look way the amount of paper on these things and, and working through them and looking at them, an affidavit, sworn affidavit and stuff really works well because it is a it is a legal document of making a claim against the department. Next. Okay, let's get into some some specific about trophy gain damage. So for trophy gain damage, again, it's mountain lion, gray wolves, black bears, grizzly bears. Those are the four we pay for. Um, we pay for livestock, and for livestock, we include multipliers for missing livestock, specific only to calves and sheep. We do not include yearling cattle as of today. Um, there will be some information discussed uh, on that topic at the commission meeting uh, later this week. Um, Part of the deal with the multipliers that we have a, what we call a pasture setting in an open range setting. The multipliers only apply in what we call an open range setting. Um, and again, it's black bears, mountain lions, gray wolves, and uh, grizzly bears in accordance with the statutes on again where gray wolves are predatory animals versus trophy game animals. Uh, again, talk about veterinary costs, value of livestock, um, young of the year. We do pay for the value of young of the year livestock that are killed at the fall leading weight marketing um, rate. So if you have a calf killed in July and you gather and ship your cattle in October and they're under a contract, we will pay for the value of that calf as you would all your other calves that were sold and shipped at that October date or under contract. That's the only um, animal that we do that with is calves and, and sheep. Scott? Yes, sir. Could you expand on pasture versus open range? Sure. Absolutely. So pasture setting is, you know, kind of as it says, it's, it's, uh, let me go back. So pasture and open range are basically defined by the topography, terrain, and vegetative characteristics um, between the two. So open range would be, you know, open mountain pasture, rough, rugged, uh, terrain, heavy vegetation, basically where an animal would get killed. And due to the vegetative, vegetative characteristics, topography, and terrain, finding that animal or other animals that have been killed or injured is difficult to find. So that's a lot of our, our Forest Service BLM leases and stuff versus a pasture setting is basically would be like a hay meadow or maybe around somebody's um, farmyard, barnyard, ranch yard, where the ability to find that animal is probably a lot easier just because there's not heavy topography, rugged terrain. Uh, thick uh, vegetation, sagebrush, mountain mahogany, and stuff where injured animals or killed animals could be hidden or go hide by the um, animal that, by the trophy game animal that killed them. So we have a clear definition of what, um, when the multiplier is is used in that uh, open range setting. And I was saying, go ahead, Albert. Well, uh, just one thing you do the same thing on with your <coughs> calves in regard to if that yearling is killed early in the grazing season. You still get paid if you have a contract for your lease at the end. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that the, yeah. that that piece is it. same with the cow, right? It's really the value of the cow in the fall, and you kind of unless you you do the damage claim immediately and turn it in, and it's right then. Right. And you go through the whole process. So both both of our livestock that killed the rates is basically that the the value of the livestock is at the price of the day that the damage claim is filed with the department. So most. Mm -hmm. In the livestock affidavits or livestock claims, we work with the producer to wait till the damage period ends so they're not filing claims throughout the year. So most of those times, as, as Albert says, is those are in the late fall, early winter, and those will be the prices that we would use. Correct. Sometimes those are sale barn prices and things like that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What we what our association does is we just turn in a, like Riverton and, and Torrington and, and the, us and the Game and fish just decide which line we're going to choose on, and that's how we choose. That's a good clarification, thank you. <coughs> um, and then you know, we do pay for um, the trophy game, we do pay for land, growing, cultivated crops, store crops, seed crops, or improvements as well. And um, you know, grizzly bears will get into a, a, a stack of oat hay, and it's not what they eat, it's kind of what they tear apart and stuff. So, um, so we're pretty all inclusive in our trophy game damage uh, coverage. And, and just one other clarification: the multiplier it can't exceed what you lose. Yes, good point. So I mean, I I mean, I had enough kills last year to get far more than I could. Correct. Just 
but I didn't lose that many. And we keep trying to look at what, you know, what was lost natural on the range and, and, and what we lost all together. Now, that doesn't mean people couldn't put in for more, but you got to sign your name on an affidavit and swear, swear that you're, that is in fact what you, what you lost. So, so to clarify, to give an example how this works, let's say producer has 10 calves verified as killed by a grizzly bear. He fills out his affidavit, but he says he, he had these 10 verified, but he thinks he missed, is missing 40 more to grizzly bears. And so that 40 and 10 is 50. But the multiplier for calves and grizzly bears is only 3.5. And so we can only pay him for 35 calves of loss to grizzly bears. On the other hand, if he had 10 calves lost to grizzly bears and claim only had two more, uh, is missing and thought to be damaged or killed by grizzly bears, total of 12, we're not going to give him 35 payment using the multiplier. It'll only be total of 12 because his losses don't are less than the, the multiplier within what uh, what is allowed. So does that make sense? Basically, you can't get ex you can't get paid for more than you're actually missing due to trophy game. And that's pretty pretty key when we when we meet with the producers on making sure we're all on the same page and on what they think has been injured by, been verified as killed by grizzly bears, what they think has been um, is missing or injured by grizzly bears, and then what are the other natural losses that come into play? Because everybody has natural losses. Scott, has, historically, has that multiplier changed, or that multiplier of 3.5 for grizzly bears has been constant for 15, 20 years? And we are actually we're, we're looking into that currently, and, and whether we modify any multiplier, include additional multipliers, yet to be seen. But that again, that'll be a discussion at the at the commission meeting. So, Tony, Scott, how about uh, we were just sidebar here, Raptors. Damage or raptor claims, do they fall under the same as the, like the grizzly or the? The game and fish has no authority or no legal responsibility of paying for raptor claims. Now, the producers of sheep producers can work with USDA Wildlife Services and the Fish and Wildlife Service on, on mitigating eagle kills, specifically on sheep. Um, over the last several years, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole of the last several years, the Wildlife Services and Fish and Wildlife Service has worked with uh, falconers to uh, haze and harass golden eagles specifically, and then removing um, uh, responsible eagles for sheep kills to um, give them to falconers as a private bird for falconing purposes. But that's only happened in the last several years. Before that, it, there wasn't much of a really program on that. But we have no responsibility on raptor, raptor damage. It's all federal. And then the other, real quick, the game birds, the migratory birds, do you have any any responsibility with, with the, or is that part of the game bird? So uh, under state statute, migratory game birds are classified as game birds in our state statute. So we do, we are responsible for migratory game bird, ducks, geese, damage, sandhill cranes. So we do pay for sandhill crane damage and goose damage are primarily our two migratory game bird waterfowl claims. Um, you get a pile of geese. Well, you know, Tony, the golf course, hey, these are top. <laughs> but we do pay a handful of, of uh, geese claims and um, sandhill, sandhill crane claims. And those are uh, geese usually on, on hay fields and cranes are usually on corn or wheat fields. Yeah. Those little buggers, cranes will go out and pick out corn seed. they will go out and find that corn seed and go just go down the road and pick out that corn seed. <laughs> so, we don't deal with ravens. We do great. There were certain quotes. So, U.S. Uh, fish and Wildlife Services. The herons with fish. You know, I don't know if you could even know how you would deal with that. So, on um, those things, you can get permits from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to legally remove those those type of species when you have a private fish hatch or your fish out pond or something. But that's a federal federal process that you have to start with since they're protected migratory birds. Sir, so, um, is the the proof of hunting on properties? Because obviously. We'll get to that. No hunting, oh, you're gonna get we'll that. get to that. Perfect. That is a that is a requirement. <laughs> um, next. So here gets into the question about uh, Commissioner Doobie's uh, question. In geographic areas determined in the department to have terrain, topography, and vegetative characteristics that influence the ability of the claimant and the department to find missing calves and sheep that are believed to be have been damaged as a result of a trophic game animal. Or gray wolf in accordance with one statute 23.901, blah, blah, blah. 
The department shall utilize the method, factors, and formulas in this subsection to determine the amount to compensate any landowner, lessee, or agent for tabs and sheet missing as a result of such damage. So that is what we consider a uh, open range setting definition, for a better word, not pasture. That is what we use to determine open range. Um, and that's kind of what that stuff says at the bottom. Um, and we talked about the uh, multiplier can exceed the total number of confirmed and then missing calves to the trophy game. So next. Okay, uh, line damage. Uh, in areas where there's line damage that is also occupied by grizzly bears, we'll pay a multiplier of 3.5 for sheep and calves. In areas not occupied by grizzly bears, we used to use a multiplier of three. And again, yearling cattle and, and older are not eligible. That's just a typical kind of picture of what a sheep looks like um, after a mountain lion has, has got to find it. And we're trying to figure out how we can get some odor to these presentations so everybody can enjoy what, what our guys get to smell after that. And Albert's been there, I'm sure she'll come along because I've been there of a, of a you know, 90 degree day and some dead ca uh, sheep or cattle and um, these guys are saints for some of the stuff they got to dig into. But they jump right in there and don't hesitate because they know that's part of their job and they want to do the right thing for the producer and also for the species in the department. Um, those guys are saints, and I'm sure Albert has some great stories about some of the stuff that he's seen them dig into. <laughs> then we're going to figure out how to get the, the, the uh, magnet impact in there, too. Uh, <laughs> Scott, uh, yes, sir. Just a question. So what's the historical context of the department of providing reimbursement for your own cow? Low story short is um, through the research that the, we looked at when we started with the um, cat multiplier. Um, it seems like that um, in those times and, and what's been done today is that it's most of it is on on um, calves and that ca uh, yearling cattle and older have been traditionally easier to find but we, we have completed some work in Cody um, and we're also going to look at maybe con maybe continuing some of the work. I don't want to get too much into it because it's a commission item but um, again we're going to start discussing a uh, possible multiplier for, for yearling but again that's, that's <coughs> Not my decision, not my call. That'll be started. Is that primarily work. driven pre-wolf issues with your like cattle? It, yeah, you know, it's been, you know, um, it's all been grizzly bear based research on calves. And then now that the wolf is in there, um, you know, it's all, you know, the wolf we do a multiplier of seven for calves. For calves. Yeah, but not yearlings. And so, again, we're working. It seems like the circumstances on the ground may have changed mm -hmm. since this was a recent research. Yeah. So, you know, when we first started getting damaged, the first group, basically the first study was on the black rock allotment by the game and fish. And out of that, they, you know, they did radio collar tags. And and, uh, and then there was another study, you know, and they showed that there was calves that weren't found, you know, that had been killed. And then there was another one on wolves that was done in Idaho, and I can't remember the name of that guy. Uh, um, so hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. hopefully. And, uh, and it showed damage beyond what was found. And, but it was all on calves. And so there's, until recently, I think you guys are starting, and I mean, you've approached us about maybe getting some tags on some new yearlings. They're going to try to do some real honest to do the studies. Oh, I know there have been some issues this year when it's up in the Cramble area, up in the Cody area, with depredation. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to provide our data to the commission tomorrow and, and what our data shows is we've seen a little uptick in our yearling loss versus uh, what's confirmed but it's not anything near three to one I can tell you that. That's yeah. just what we see in our lot. There are a lot of factors that come into play on, on determining and, and finding injured livestock regardless of the age, of the age class and just leaving it at that as you know, everybody knows every does runs their operation different has different people on the ground number of people on the ground and things like that so, so yeah we have five riders on the ground every day you know, that's a huge lot but, <laughs> but it's on the ground every day and i wrote that a lot like, for five days and never covered all of it yeah <laughs> all right let's go on to the next all right, black bear and grizzly bear again, just like with lions, if there's uh, grizzly bear occupied areas for black grizzly bear damage, we play sheep calves at 3.5 to 1. Non occupied grizzly bear areas, we uh, pay black bear for sheep times three, no, no calves in that one. 
and again, um, yearling cattle are not eligible for our, our calves. So um, when they pay the multiplier of three on, on sheep outside of the grizzly bear occupied area. Next. They won't damage the livestock. Again, <coughs> sheep calves uh, of, that have been verified, confirmed times seven. Again, the statute of, that uh, also allows for payment um, in the predator area where they're uh, contiguous with uh, trophy and land. And again, here the cattle are not eligible. Can I ask a very why, why not? What's that? Why, why are yearly cattle eligible? Again, just like we talked about, there's not a lot of research to show that, that we have scientific data to show exactly how many yearling cattle are damaged but not found. Um, you know, they're a different size animal. They have different behaviors than calves, um, and cow pairs and stuff. So there's several factors that come into play on yearling. Again, um, the department has, has uh, looked at this. We just completed a, a two-year project that we'll do some uh, presentation on at the commission meeting uh, this week and start some uh, discussion again. So we have been on the work for Cattle, they pay for a year and it's killed. Yeah. So it's a one to one or a cow or whatever. Yeah. And so we pay for yearly, we pay for all age costs. We just don't have the multiplier. Maybe I need to put that in the. I, I, I read this so many times, I know what I'm saying. I, I know what I'm saying, but maybe not what you guys are, are hearing. So yearly cattle are not eligible for the multiplier. They're, pay, they're eligible for a one to one on the uh, for damage compensation. Okay. That's a good question because I, I, I look at it all the time. So I know what, I know what, I, what it says. Um, we use the more likely than not standard um, for determining damage. Um, and more likely than not means evidence responsible, responsibly tending to support the conclusion, evidence that is competent, relevant, and materials in which a rational and impartial mind naturally leads or involuntarily leads to conclusions for which there's a valid, just, and reasonable substantiation. Um, that's that's our standard. It works well. Again, key to this thing I've said several times is, is the partnership and working together with the claimant and our people are a key to success of damage claims. Um, we want to make sure that the, the, the claim or, or the injured animal or whatever meets the statutory and regulatory uh, requirement. Um, do we have the correct species? Are we responsible for that species? Um, have we done the right filing and reporting? Um, we make sure that our, our uh, details and investigation reports are uh, justified, detailed, uh, the math is correct, and um, come up with a payment recommendation again, which is a full pay, partial pay, or denial of payment. Um, they sit, submit it to uh, me and Casper. Um, I review it. I have uh, an outstanding assistant um, who takes the initial review, and she is brutal, um, um, just brutal. Um, these are legal documents, and, and with money involved, we want to make sure all our I's, all our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. But overall, our folks do a really darn good job on these. Um, and we offer full partial payment or not <coughs> claim. We send a letter to the claimant telling what our determination is, and then if we deny it, we, we tell them why it's been denied. Scott, I just want to tell you, I mean, I think you guys have been awesome. Thank you. In, in our area, and I mean, we've had a lot of damage, and it gets I mean, a lot, and it gets hard on cowboys, cattle, you guys, and I, I just appreciate so much what you guys have done over the years. Um, and, uh, it's, and and you gotta you gotta somehow find more help for those damaged guys because it's gonna run them into the ground. It's tough. It's tough work. It's seven days a week, eighteen hour days, because you know there were, sometimes there there's kills in three different pastures. And it's, it's just tough, it's tough work for those guys. And I know they truly appreciate those words, and I have, I am behind you 100. percent That you know, our, especially during the, the grazing season, we have we have a handful of folks that that deal strictly with trophy game damage, and you know they're working 300 hours a a, a month, um, forced back, living in a tent or whatever, and um, basically camping out, and, and they are dedicated to make sure that this these damage issues are addressed professionally, properly, knowing that, you know, if we address damage properly and, and, and producers are, are compensating accordingly, that does provide some support for the species, um, you know, species conservation and stuff versus saying, you know, we're not going to pay anything and, and you're on your own, that, that probably would work out so well for some of these um, large carnivore species on the landscape, but 
you will not find a more dedicated group of guys than, than the guys that do these large carnivore trophy game claims, as well as our game wardens, even though they're dealing with maybe not as controversial claims and controversial species, but um, you know, looking at uh, hay, hay damage, growing hay damage, cornfield damage, things like that. I mean, it's a priority and, and um, it does take a lot of time, a lot of early mornings, late nights, um, and things like that, but they're committed and dedicated. And again, I'll show, tell you some stats about our overall damage claim figures and, and, and the outcomes of those. And again, that shows the dedication of our, our people for doing that. So, and, I, and I was really joking about the smell of magnets, but that's what they have to dig through. I mean, it's, it's pretty rank. <laughs> it's pretty rank. Um, next. Uh, again, um, if the, if the, uh, we, we get our investigation report. We send a letter back to the claimant saying, "Here's our recommendation." Uh, if the producer or claimant accepts it, they fill out they, we fill out this form for them and send it in the mail, and then they sign it. If they accept payment, that's the end of the claim. They have no legal recourse once they sign and submit that in that form. Um, and then once we get that form, we submit it uh, for payment, and we get those done within 45 days. But they're usually a lot quicker than that. Sometimes we have to do follow-up because if you're a first-time claimant or some additional paperwork you have to fill out to get into the state payee system. And again, Kendra, my, my outstanding assistant, right-hand person, takes care of that and works with these producers on the fiscal. <laughs> a lot of times, even, even me, we don't understand it. We rely on other people to help us through that and stuff. So, um, so uh, we try to help them through that payment process as smooth and painless as, as, as possible. Next. All right. What do we do for trying to prevent damage? Um, you know, it's one of our again responsibilities. You know, we just don't go out and say, okay, submit a damage claim. We'll see in three months and for the number. You know, we try to set season structure to address a damage. We look at um, license availability, increase uh, analyst tags, or say we're making certain licenses only can be used. Uh, we have a lot of hazing and pyrotechnics um, that we can use. We can issue lethal tank permits, which is outside of the hunting seasons, which authorizes this district commissioner pool for the department or their designee to, to remove um, animals outside of, out of hunting seasons without hunting licenses. Um, we have a hunter landowner assistance program on the website where landowners can call and say, hey, I'm looking to get you know 15 white-tailed doe hunters. Put my name on there. And, and people can call me and I'll make out their arrangements directly um, with them. And that works out pretty well. Of course, we also have our, our Access Yes program, which we use at times to help address damage. Um, we work with landowners on, on maybe they plant an alfalfa crop somewhere different that's not maybe going to get so much attention from, from elk. And then something we haven't used for many, many years, we do have the lawful authority to have depredation seasons, which are licensed seasons outside of the normal seasons and a lot of times those happen um december january february um late uh mid to late winter where there's unique circumstances where there's still some significant damage the only way to reduce that is actually remove numbers and it's better off to use licensed hunters the public than having our folks um go out and do that they that takes a lot of coordination and planning um like i said we haven't done those for for many years um but that is something on on the table that that is at our disposal um, our whole kind of damage evaluation is uh, found in a about a six inch thick uh, manual and it's called uh, prevention techniques um, to uh, to prevent the uh, handbook of wildlife depredation techniques manual um, and specifically the sections here we use in damage prevention are sections three and four so um, like I said we have a manual that outlines everything from soup to nuts regarding wildlife damage and actually it's kind of the the Bible for many other states, and we provided that to other states that have thought about including damage in their programs or just wanted to see what our damage uh, techniques manual looks like. Next. So, how do we pay for this program? Uh, Wyoming Statute 23 2101E basically says the applications, the application fees, which are $5 for residents and $15 for non residents. Shall be collected and, and placed into to a fund uh, during 1980 and beyond, so not to exceed 25%. And we need to make any working balance of at least $500,000 to compensate owners or leases of property 
damage by emails and game birds. When that statute was passed, $500,000 was, was plenty of money to cover the damage program, but um, that figure is, is uh, twice and some above that thing, but we still maintain the $500,000 working balance to, to cover uh, damage costs. How many dollars here comes in the application fees total? Thank you. Yeah. Coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Next. There you go. That's kind of hard to, to read. Um, long story short is that we get more money in application fees than the damage program costs. And that's in, in, in the in your presentation. You might be able to read it. I think I have it here. I can I can get you to it. So let's just take in 2021, resident um, application revenue was 841,000 and some change. Non-resident application revenue was 2.1 million and some change for a total of <coughs> over 3 million. And we spent uh, 1.079 million on damage in FY21. So there's a difference of about 1.9 million on the positive. Scott, those dollars are then just rolled over into that account for the next year? I believe so. They just maintain they maintain that working balance. Well, I think we actually just have to make five five hundred thousand, but I, I'm not the fiscal guy, so I, I don't want to tell you the wrong things. They they just roll into the gammon fish general fund. Okay, that's we just true. take the revenue from those and we say five hundred thousand goes in this pot and we maintain that balance all the time. All the rest of the revenue goes <coughs> in the big pot. So there's a between the total of Revenue application, revenue damage claim distributions. That's a, a difference of 1.9 million, and that and that, that results in a 579,000 and change difference. So they must roll that, like like Brian just said, to maintain that 500,000 dollars required working balance. Does it, does it historically seem to be a, a surplus? Is that had the figure over like the last 10 years? Yeah. So since 2012, we've had a surplus. Of 147,000, 2013, 471,000 and some change, 2014, 200,000 and change. So there has been a surplus, um, increasing surplus throughout the years. When it started, there was not. Right. Yeah. This doesn't sort of be Well, we, there is no application fee. Yeah, no, I mean, this difference between the damage, are you just talking about damage with gain and that's all our, our damage costs, our damage payment. All of it. All of it. One. All of it. All of it. Doesn't doesn't distinguish that excluding trophy game would be all our damage fees, our damage payments. Not we have additional costs related to damage with regards to manpower and damage prevention materials and stuff. Hey, Scott, I have a question. Um, do we have any payments from any NGOs or say Defenders of Wildlife or any of those payments that come in, and how is that handled? We get nothing. Yeah, yeah. There's, we haven't had one of those forever. We used to get some for wolves, but we did administer it. It was, it was a separate program. The Defenders of Wildlife would compensate for wolf damage, and then that dried up and went away. So the entire damage payment is on Wyoming sportsmen's sports person dollars. So with one exception, there was a very small yeah. grant from Defenders of Wildlife not too many years ago where they it was specific to, I think, Flagery and Jackson. Or yeah, something. I mean, that's, it was some. It was a very small amount. Mitigation techniques, but not actual payments to a to an affected producer. So okay. Scott, this Thank number you. is just for damage payment. Correct. I know there's other things that the department does for landowners. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Because I want when we get done with this, I want to know the total cost. Got it. Including <laughs> Got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just following your trail. Okay. Um, and I got that all for, like I said, I'll give you some figures for FY21 that will have all that in there. Good. So, Thank you. That's that? Mm -hmm. I'm tracking. All right. So this is just a, a flow chart of the of the uh, damage compensation program from, from start to finish from being notified of damage to um, if we all went all the way to district court and most of these claims end with the department's recommendation of a full and partial payment very few 
go to appeal, arbitration, or district court. Again, that, as I said it many times, is because of the hard work of our people and their ability to work in a positive fashion with uh, producers, landowners, filing claimant, and, and that's key to this deal. Most claims that are that maybe are partial payment is not because maybe there's a disagreement, but at times there's a disagreement, and, and a lot of times it's not a lot of money, but a lot of times maybe it's a math error on on the claimant side, um, this misunderstanding of the regulation and stuff. So one expectation that we have that we hold our people to is if it's a partial payment, the claimant is called or contacted by by the game warden prior to them to receiving notice from the department because we do not want a surprise thinking that a, that a claimant submitted a $10,000 damage claim and he's only going to get $8,000. That's just not right finding something in the mail that you're, you, you know, you're not getting a full payment. So we, we have our people call that person and tell them, hey, we're going to have a partial payment and this is why. And a lot of times it's like, I'm good with that. I'm not worth my time filling another claim. I screwed up and we'll get it fixed next time. Again, that comes to that relationship and the dedication between the, the parties involved. So, um, it looks a lot more convoluted than it is. Um, it's a great time. <laughs> Next. All right. Again, um, that's just a, a tender uh, summary of, of damage. So FY12 is on the left. FY21 is on the far right. The diagonal um, line across the top is the total number of claims. So let's just take FY21. We had uh, 151 claims filed for just over 1.9 million, and we paid just over 1.2 million. And the difference there is because of that one very specific claim um, that makes up a difference of about 250,000 um, based on livestock and the use of unlawful uh, multipliers, and then another claim, kind of the same thing. Of, claiming everything under the sun for damages from a horse trailer to a house to drones, to all kinds of stuff that is Fire not radios for the higher yeah, you know, you know, stuff that's not authorized by law. So um, but it's it, it fluctuates. Um, I know a question that's gonna be what are the high what species cost the most and I'll get into that as well. Um, next well, that's um, kind of everything about statutes and regs and, and some uh, current figures, and I'll get into a whole bunch more, but um, that's one of our hazing te techniques. Um, <laughs> dark and back to, you, know, you see those at stores and stuff, and um, it's a pretty good technique that we've used, and they're fairly inexpensive. And, uh, Scott, over, that, uh, that also works pretty good for desensitizing horses. <laughs> <That's laughs> <right. laughs> You've seen that, haven't you? Yes, I have. <laughs> Just Dwayne provides some excellent horse training for our folks and, and uh, had his place and I believe we use that as he said to get horses used to something they've never seen before. Yeah. That pops up in a, in a field with a bunch of elk, they're like, what in the sand heck is that? <laughs> but it's amazing how they'll become accustomed to that as well as a lot of our, our techniques. So let's go. I think that have a badge on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the red shirt. Um, Scott, is there, is there a component of assumptive risk, especially like where predator damages are concerned? I mean, if I bring a dozen donuts to a football meeting for the coaches and all the offensive linemen are there, those donuts are going to disappear, right? There's some assumptive risk. If you're putting cattle on the landscape where bears, wolves, mountain lions, or sheep, Exist isn't there some assumptive risk for that? There's not, not in accordance with our statute regs. We oh. we will pay regardless if they're uh, killed or injured by a trophy game animal. There's damage to to, to a crop by a big game animal. We we are we are required by law to pay for it regardless. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I'll just comment on it. So it's a takings of my private property, and uh, by statute it's a takings, and this is the recourse for that too. And, uh, and I'll be honest, if, if we didn't get compensation from the Game and Fish Department, we would be off the landscape. It's that bad. Our, our losses have went, calf losses have went from a 2% calf loss rate to 10 to 13% calf loss rate across our lot. It's, it's damage that we can't sustain at home. And uh, and we have no recourse. We can't hunt. We can't shoot that animal. We can't do anything about it. We just have to live with it. And the only way we can live with it is with this compensation. 
they, these are all grizzly bear fossils. Uh, the bulk of ours, you know, wolves are annoyance in our area. I, I call them compared to grizzly bears. <laughs> the grizzly bears are the problem. This increase you've seen over the last decade? Seen over since 1990. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's just gone like this. And now it's plateaued at about 10 to 10 percent is kind of where we're at now on cat loss rates. But it's incredible. Um, so I, and this is just in, because I don't know things. Um, if there is a delisting, would that affect damage? I mean, if, if there is, you know, we're allowed to hunt that that predator, would that be the effect? The you know, I think the delisting helps the managers, which are the game and fish, manage individual bears that more so than they are now, mm -hmm. where they have to ask permission. Mm -hmm. um, so, it might a first time offending bear, if they think that bears had some um, history that they don't know about, they might do something with it. So, in that regard, but because we, you know, for example, in my area, right, we are in the uh, we're not in like the primary recovery area, but we're in, I'll just call it the DMZ, right? We're in that, we're in that area where they are now because of, of, of basically because of conditions they made with the federal government, you know. With, and so delisting will, I think, help. But it's not a panacea for stopping damage. In fact, the damage will continue at nearly the same rate it continues to be, is my case. Go ahead, Larry. Just real quick, I kind of, on, on Adam's point of uh, presumptive risk, and I think that's out there, but I, I think the real concept is you have to get your hand around. This is the public, if wildlife truly belongs to the public, then it's the public's wildlife taking private property. So there's got to be a compensatory mechanism. No different than there's an assumptive risk anytime you run out there on public land that somebody may arbitrarily go out there and shoot livestock. That's a civil penalty that we have within our law. So it comes back to the idea of so if the public property is damaging somebody's private property, what's the remedy for that? And the remedy that we come up with a statutory scheme is, is that the department compensates those for the public good. No different than if somebody goes out and shoots your livestock, you have civil recourse to that back to the court. So I think there's a presumption out there, and I think that's always been part of that. But the remedy that we've come up with is what we have today. And so if people don't like the remedy, then, then we need to have that discussion and debate it, but really it's a compensation for takings of a public resource taking a private resource. And, and so anyway, just a thought process. I wanted to go back to Lisa's question real quick. So, mm -hmm. so I agree with Albert. Inside the DMA, it does help with, with actual individual bear management. There's not any opportunity really even in the delisted population to have like population reduction in the upper green. And you could you could make a little dent in it, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. But it does have, I think, a significant <coughs> potential impact outside of the DMA where bears have moved outside of suitable habitat where we can really increase harvest using hunters. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I would say is that there is an effect from a delisted wolf population. Mm -hmm. We've reduced the wolf population mm -hmm. in Northwest Wyoming, and that has had an impact on livestock damage. Mm -hmm. So that's Pete, you had it. I think there's two things. This is effective for probably 99% of landowners. Uh, it's very few people that have a problem with the system or, or go through the arbitration process. And secondly, the thing, it's a fallacy that many of the public think like every landowner gets damages. There's not that many. It's much less than I thought when I first came on here, because if you're a commissioner, you get every letter from every damage claim in your area. There's not that many. I was very surprised at, at the lack of, of landowners who actually apply for damages. It's not as rapid as some of the public think that every landowner is getting these huge damage claims. That's not true. One thing I missed is I have a question about hunting. So the law doesn't require that to be eligible for damage compensation from the department. You do have to allow hunting. And basically that is that you have to allow enough access to remove the number of animals that are recruited into the population for the 
following year. That's the standard requirement. So you do have to allow hunting. Most of that obviously is is big game damage, um, you know, black bear lions and things like that. A lot of that happens on a public land or you know a bear shows up out of the blue and you really can't plan for that happening and, and, and having a hunter come take it. But there is a mandatory hunting uh, component that has to come into play for um, eligibility to receive compensation. How is that tracked on private parcels? We work with um, the landowner, uh, look at the landowner coupons, have discussions with the landowner, things like that. So it's a it's a two-way conversation and um, some of the bigger ones, you know, we may sit down with them and say, you know, based on our counts, our, our classifications, number of fawns that are recruited, you need to allow X number of hunters in. Now, realize that we can't dictate whether someone actually pulls the trigger or, or hits, hits something, yeah, but as long as that person's allowed in there with the intent that most people want to be successful, um, that, that meets the requirement. But it's, it's a... It's, an, it's a discussion we have. There's so that it's up to the landowner to provide that through outside of. <laughs> it's part of the, of, the, of the affidavit that they have to say how many hunters they let in. Um, you know, sometimes it's, you can't predict that. Something may just come out of the blue that's odd and you can't do that. But, you know, most most producers, uh, landowners, they don't want this damage to continue on forever. They want to you know, they want to help themselves and stuff and see hunting as a, as a, a tool of doing it. Now there's, they can charge, I'm going to be right, you know, they can charge an access fee, they can have an outfit or whatever they want, but as long as they're allowing access in accordance with what's required in the rig, um, that's fine. Hawkins. I'll, I'll challenge just a little on that, and we've dealt with it, I, I hesitate to go very far, but on my specific piece, I'm dealing with a personal one here. Uh, we went through those numbers with your folks, and they gave us recommended numbers. And we consequently left the department manage the hunting on that parcel for two years. We didn't take any other hunters other than a few friends that hunted bucks, but we left them manage it. And they failed to do it. We're still battling over how we do numbers. And I go back to some of your other relatives and how we do it. Just our deals, you can see from the air, which I know you're aware, the deer trails, these drought years, deer being drowned really pulls them in. You know, you get to the point on some of these, and I get people calling me on the others, and I think it's going to get worse, probably with elk more than deer. But uh, these whitetail corridors are horrible damage. You know, shared when you go into our country, you get some up in the Powell area. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the things this task force needs to deal with is one, do you want the deer there, and do you want the numbers of them? Because we aren't allowed as landowners, I feel just like Albert does, we don't have the tools to remove them. I have them during the growing season and they're gone during the hunting season. Uh, they do substantial damage. And the damage system is really a difficult one to deal with. Because you can count deer and it's like saying, well, we turned 100 yearlings out on the hay field or 100 sheep. And what they eat is a tiny part of the actual damage when you're using big numbers. It's the bed grounds, the trailing, the, and, and, it, and it's stand damage for us. Our alfalfa stands last half. Uh, I will tell you, game and fish, we've got an up and down history with them. I hesitate to talk a lot about it, but they paid the game fence, one of my sprinklers, about 30 years ago, Brian. Uh, we get one cutting a year more off of that parcel. It gets a full cutting and it produces a little over two and a half tons a year more hay on alfalfa, apple stabs. So we've got an actual ability to see what it is. And we like the deer, don't get me wrong. I, uh, we go back and forth and my numbers kind of been three, four hundred deer depending on how you count. But I think that problem's going to get exacerbated as we get into higher crop values. It gets scary. It's one thing when you're talking $100 eggs, you start getting $100 eggs, the numbers get big. And the, the ouch factor gets wild. That's for us, and we end up buying hay when you pay to sprinkle and fertilize and you don't produce. And that's one of the things I'm hoping that you can find a way one, how you actually prove what the actual damage is. Cause I don't like the process that's there, and I don't think it's fair. We, we work in Colorado State 30 years.
years <laughs> of this. We really haven't had any playing tournaments. 25 years on our ranch and now we're back to where we're we're battling numbers and we don't know how to deal with them uh, it's, it's it's tough and it's huge dollars uh, that was one thing i asked was the amount of damage between livestock and crop damage and how much you see spike in these droughts here because you know i see down by douglas you see now a little the center that's down there uh, white-tailed deer, and now the elk are starting to run in. I'm getting guys in my country, and I know you guys are aware of it. Three, five hundred elk show up on a hay field in the spring, and you know it's a country they turn into before they go to the mountains. It's gone. In two or three days, they just take it out. And I, I think that's part of what this group needs to do is figure out one, how you deal with it, and second, do you want the game there if you want something? And that's uh, one of the deals. I see my outfitter's not here, but he was in tears about it. You know, okay, try to kill the deer that they want to kill because it's deer in the whole area and the droughts here. They come in for 15 miles around us. And if we go in there and just flat wipe them out, uh, it generally doesn't affect our base deal a lot, but it affects the neighbors. Uh, we, we killed. Two, three thousand deer, thirty years ago, and it took a couple, about a decade to get it back in balance. And I, I don't have answers. I'm just, I'm telling you that where we lay and where it's at, and that the yeah. country is going to get as you go into it. It's hard. Let me, let me chime in really quick, agenda wise. Um, one of our topics to tackle then, um, in the solution <laughs> generating time, is what changes could we make to it? So for that's coming. Um, while we have Scott here, are there any other questions? Because um, we'll we'll have a full discussion of what improvements could be made. Are there any other questions while we have Scott here to understand what the current system is um, before we jump into how we might improve it? It's still got quite a bit to go, right, Scott? Oh, yeah. There's so just, one. Just one little side note is you know the department does provide damage prevention materials, and that's primarily in the form of, of haystack yards. We provide the posts with post steel posts and, and wire. Um, the expectation, again, is there often expectations that if we provide those materials, you put them up as a way to, to prevent, mitigate damage. And if you fail to put that stuff up and you continue to have damage, that, that could be a grounds for um, denying your damage claims. So um, we have given out a lot of stack yards. We don't provide the labor. We don't provide gates because every Everybody has a different way they want to install them or what kind of gate you want, where they want them, and when they have time to put them up. But um, we have given out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of stack yards over the years um, across Wyoming to put uh, stored crops in. Um, we don't uh, fence uh, growing crops, we don't fence hay fields, alfalfa fields, bean fields, things like that. Um, again, we just work with producers um, on um, ways to mitigate that damage. Uh, we have provided some temporary electric fence, and we're experimenting with some other ways of, of using that um, with some success. So we're continuing to look at ways to improve our, our damage prevention mitigation um, techniques. So just here's some here's some up, up to date. Uh, this is a draft info because we still have some <coughs> in, in the legal process. Um, uh, to address Senator Hicks's question, our, our total damage program cost in FY21 was $2.44 million. We break that down. Prevention was $940,607. Our damage handling was $256,095. And our payment of claims was $1,244,195. We've been as high as uh, 2.5 million and as low as 1.9 million um, over the last uh, 10 years. So, so Scott, I'm not familiar with all the numbers. Sure, I'm going to get into those. Yep. But the, the, which one of those includes land on a coupon? Prevention. Prevention. Yep. What was that? 940,000. We could. Frank, do you have access to what we paid for land order coupons in, in FY21? I'm curious just what that total, what total of that amount is. Do you have access to that? Uh, I can probably look it up. I don't have no time. And, and we just report as a big lump sum, you know, that we don't break it out into land order coupons and stuff. Of course, damage um, handling is, you know, the, 
the handling of claims and stuff like that. And of course, the claims paid is pretty self explanatory. So, yes, and members of the committee, the reason I asked that question is I think that needs to come into the calculation if we start looking at some other compensatory mitigation. The, the number we're paying out right now for some type of land or damage claim or incentive or provisions, 2.4 to 2.5 million dollars. So, so what level of incentive would reduce that cost of the department? And I, and I think as we go forward, that's just a number to keep in the back of your head. Is there a based <coughs> program that we can provide to landowners? That would offset that cost, that direct cost of the department. And that's the reason I wanted that bottom dollar in my own mind is what's on um, just uh, on a financial situation, what's a compensatory level that we should evaluate <coughs> uh, as an offset? Because ultimately that's coming up sportsman or management dollars to a certain degree. So, do you, do you have an idea on that, Larry? What you've been thinking about as, as a starting point for that discussion? I do, but I don't think that's on the agenda right now, Mr. Chairman. So, <laughs> I can't I'm, I'm glad you know what you're thinking about. Right? I do have a question. So this sheet, it says damage claim distribution. You probably said this distribution is twenty twenty one million seventy nine thousand, and then this sheet. Uh, damage amount paid is 1.2 million. So I'm trying to understand the different numbers. So if you look at the damage distributions, which I would assume is the same as damage paid, it's different on two sheets. And I'm just. Hmm. It's a, uh, well, I think, I think of the calendar year versus fiscal year. I, I, I can't say for sure, but we are do our damage claim on a fiscal year, and these. License years are on a calendar year, so I'm guessing that that's probably the difference. Okay. And that's something I have to remember every time because we do have figures like that at times that that are different, and that's because of how they're calculated on a, on a 12 month basis. So the actual damage one would be that the fiscal year number is what the total damage is that we pay on, on the calendar on a fiscal year basis. Mr. Chairman, yes, back down on that. <laughs> Directions. So, Scott, do we know how much we're actually paying out in the Access Yes program, too? Uh, it's like a, I, I got that report in my truck. Don't hold me to this. I think it's a million bucks. Brian, you know off the top of your head? That's roughly where it says. So and that's but, to landowners, direct payments. So, direct payments for landowners for Access Yes, prevention, the damage. And that's an annual number, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And just for a side note, that access just report we're required to submit that by law by February first. The TRW, so that will be coming for the letter on TRW. That access just report will be coming. So, so do us a favor, Scott, and those numbers. About FY twenty one. I know they're preliminary. You can run preliminary on it, but would you send those to me um, just in an email, and I'll get them to the committee because they could come up in discussion later. And then, did you say the difference between crop damage versus trophy game? No, but I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and give you guys, a, for FY21, how many claims we had, okay. the percentage of the total claim paid, and what that amount was. Okay. So we'll have a little bit. Who, what species do you think we paid the highest amount? Is it fair? Is it fair? <laughs> oh, elk. So here I'll just go through. Um, do we have? Let me just clarify for folks. Um, do we have slides or handout for this, or is it? I don't. This, this is stuff I okay, have. that's right. So just I'm wanted sorry. to clarify in case people were rifling through to find it. So elk in FY21, we had 41 claims that totaled 358,601 dollars. That was 29 percent of our our damage claims. Second was grizzly bears. Uh, 33 claims for $313,451. That was 25%. Number three is Gray Wolf with 22 claims for $185,630, 15%. Or, <coughs> might be surprising for some of you, White Tail Deer, $147,902 for 12%. Uh, five is Black Bear, 19 claims for $80,000. 951% or $958 at 7%. Six is Mount Lion, 26 claims for $74,453. That's 6%. Seven is Mule Deer, 
25 claims for $48,822, which is 4%. And eight is antelope, 18 claims for $30,872, 2%. And number nine, no surprise game bird, three claims for $1,952. So that's less than 1%. So, Scott, I just want to be clear that you're not advocating for more wolves and grizzly bears to eat the elk to reduce the damage. <laughs> no, I'm not advocating that. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> and then, uh, is that what was paid out or flying? That's what paid out. And then number 10 is moves for uh, $1,554. Uh, so, to Ogden's point, though, that's not. I mean, these numbers fluctuate. The drought oh, is way higher for That's a one elk and white tail deer in the yeah. drought. And this year was a better year statewide uh, than it's been for a while on trophy game. So for bears and wolves, um, it was a little bit better this year. So, I mean, both of those numbers go up and down. And it, I'll tell you what, it is amazing how things change when it's a really dry year. Because there's a lot of... There's a lot of landowners that just tolerate it in a year when they got really good production. Right. They they still have damage, but they just tolerate it because they're still going to be able to make ends meet. But when it's drought, I mean, they got to do whatever they can to try to come out somewhere in the black. Uh, hey, on the elk, is that those claims from more eastern Wyoming? Or? No, they're kind of statewide, but our, our bigger claims come from eastern Wyoming. You know, um, obviously, LP grounds in, in Jackson, Pine Gully counties definitely mitigate elk damage in that country. Um, but a lot of it come from the um, Sheridan region, Cass region, Laramie region. Um, so, you know, kind of the um, where we have a mixture of public and private land kind of situations. But yeah, also our standing crop, stored crop, dominating. A lot of it's growing, growing crop, um, alfalfa. And we do get some. Um, stored crop damage down in, in like the Saratoga Valley and stuff, but again, we the crop riding stack there to try to minimize that. But a lot of it's just is growing crop. Um, and that's expensive. For Tony hunts, Tony can tell you up there up south at Glen Rock, we get uh, significant elk damage. Plus, the heart of those landowners, we worked well with them and we compensated them. They've done everything they can in their power, still out hunting and things like that. And, um, it's a tough situation, and, uh, but that's. That's uh, area seven six are two of our big elk damage areas, and then down in down in the um, Medicine Bow, down into the um, Laramie country. Hey, did you want a landowner coupon payment? Yeah, what do you pay for that? Yeah, well, just rough numbers. We got current numbers coming for twenty one, um, but from twenty eighteen on, there's roughly thirty four, thirty five, thirty five thousand. Uh, coupons that are paid out, and that's about five hundred and twenty thousand dollars to six hundred thousand a year. So that's kind of a you know, breakdown. Um, elk <coughs> damage has been increasing over over my tenure. Um, as Brian said, grizzly bear and, and wolf kind of stabilized. They used to be the big two, um, but they've kind of you know reduced a little bit. Stuff and a lot of factors that come into damage: environmental factors, crop uh, price. Uh, factors, then our tolerance factors, rangeland health. Rangeland health. I just don't want game and fish coming to my place. I'll be with it myself. I mean there's a lot of things that come into damage. So it's you know it's not just one thing that that, that impacts damage. Well there's years when it's not Albert can testify to this. There's years when you can't really explain it, but um, grizzly bear and wolf de depredations go up and not necessarily because it's dry or anything else they just go up and that's the trend line last year was a little better but the trend line is still like this how much new country are they moving into i have people calling me to the east a lot. south fast country oh yeah there's, there's, there's south south it's fast. starting to get to be a huge problem in some of those areas there's not a lot of damage down on the winds on the south end of the winds there is obviously in the north end of the winds where Albert's at. But most of that new damage is to the east of the assorted front, a little bit in due voice. So, first thing that there's grizzly bears all the way down the Wyoming range, but there's no sheep left in that country, so you don't get the damage claims. Well, they're in the cattle, so that's why I know some people in that country that are losing cattle. And I don't think they've been turning in, but it's getting about like you are out of this problem. So, the thing about damage is, damage is individual state decision. But 
legislative legal decision. And some states have it, some states don't, but Wyoming currently, for many, many, many years, has the most comprehensive damage compensation program of anywhere in the world that we're aware of. Again, I think that has a lot of pros in the fact that it provides for tolerance of those species on the landscape. Uh, as someone said here, you know, they probably get compensated for these, probably some significant financial impact impacts for, for landowners, producers, farmers, ranchers, but also probably some significant impacts to, this, to those species. Uh, it wasn't compensation for, for having them on, on the landscape. So uh, again, our folks work well with this, um, producers and get through this. 95% of them, I've said this before, <coughs> I'll reiterate, 95% of these claims are handled with, without any um, um, confrontation or, or negative outcomes, um, they're a win-win. So take that into consideration. Um, it's definitely not broke. Could it be tweaked? Sure. Could it be tweaked? Or the department is continually looking at new ways to look at damage, how to handle damage. Um, but you know, wildlife is wildlife, and the books they read maybe not be the books we read. So, mm -hmm. so the Stinson thing in our area, you know, over the last several years has made a huge difference. In like elk damage on a, you know, when they do mm -hmm. encroach out, that's that's solved. I bet 85, 90 some percent of it. You know, our our area it's not so much. Well, there's not a lot of elk out in the country. You know, it's, it's grass head, and so it's damage. You know, from animals coming off the stacks, and your instant program is pretty well solved that. I think. Yeah, it's, you know, we do get some federal assistance. I think we still do. We used to from uh, Bruce Lopes' federal Bruce Lopes litigation funding to help provide some stack yards. So that's been pretty handy too. So we have had some outside money in, in uh, the feed ground areas to help with that. Now actually have some big places in the country for stack yards. So sure. Yeah, and this is going to segue a little bit into what Carrie was saying about solutions. But, you know, in your comment about tweaking, it might also be a question for Brian or Pete. But has there ever been any discussion about preemptive preemptive programs? Whereas we understand you're going to have 2,000 head elk on your place, and let's just pay you for that, which we know you're going to you're, is going to be lost. You know, you know, we actually kind of do that now. To be honest with you, um, we know there are certain areas of the state where we know we're going to have elk damage year after year after year. The, the funny thing is that we have damage here when it comes to hunting season. Those out look at the calendar and say, oh, I'm out of here. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, there is times where basically you might as well just pay the claim because one, the, the work to mitigate the damage or moving those out somewhere else or whatever um, is just going to create more work and possibly damage for other people. So there is times when we just say, you know, we're going to work here, we're going to monitor the damage, and at the end of the day, it's easier for us to, to pay you and ripping down fences and burning up a man time known at the end of the day we're probably going to have the same results so scott larry, larry has a oh yes sir yeah scott i and i agree with your characterization that the wyoming game and fish department pays out more financial incentives direct payments through a multitude of things as if you laid out but it gets back to my other comments some of the other states and western states have looked at other compensatory type incentive programs so they're not paying those direct dollars out and and I still think that's something that we need to look at as we move forward. Not to say that what they're doing is any better than what we're doing, but I think we should examine those alternatives and see if there is a way to provide those incentives that would also reduce the cost of the department. And there may be a trade-off there that works for everybody. But I think that's a a very accurate statement, but I do think we need to look at should consider at some point in time other mechanisms. Rusty and I have talked about this a little bit as well, and I think probably the best solution for us as a committee moving forward would be the, the interest of the subcommittee. I would assume, Larry, you would be interested in that. Albert, you would make perfect sense for this as well. <laughs> Are there others? Ogden. Ogden, yeah. I can feel people itching to get to that solutions point, and, and I'm interested to get there too. Um, any other questions? Okay, for Scott, before we wrap up with him. So, you know, one thing we, you know, I've always tried to advocate is you know, on the grizzly bear side, it's a national issue, it's not just a state issue. And, and how do we get um, more federal help on the side of compensation? So, I know there's been some talk out there and some bills 
lately I'm wondering if there's any movement on the, on the front from Congress to get more money. No. No. Great. <laughs> Paul, do we have any um, of our online task force members with questions? I just want to make sure we don't forget about them, especially since we can't see them today. No, no one's mentioned anything. But, okay. Um, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. You know, one thing that we that we are seeing, <coughs> you guys all know this, and it's just obvious, is that change in ownership of, of large land, land, private land holding in Wyoming, the ability to allow hunting and providing refuges, which is a huge factor on neighboring um, landowners. Damage situation, which is a tough situation for us, you know, is that someone harbors, you know, 500 elk and they don't hunt and then they wander onto their neighbors after the hunting season increased and take discontent and damage. So that's a pretty big factor in this deal is, is changing ownership and not providing hunting or adequate hunting to help one manage, you know, the, our elk objective, which we have for uh, population objectives for elk and all species, but two is da the damage uh, that, that creates. Um, outside of hunting season and you know we we don't have a and it's not fair to say that you, know, you can't get the energy because your neighbor doesn't allow hunting that's not fair so that's 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 something we're dealing with quite regularly now is is these refuges of, of elk or specifically elk during the hunting season where we get no harvest and then they disperse after that and create damage that we have to deal with so that's that's something that uh, when someone can come up with a silver bullet on that that'd be great. <laughs> it's an interesting case where you you want to it is some exclusion. I think part of the silver bullet with that, and really the silver bullet, that is thinking outside of the box on the season. You may want to shoot some of these in what is considered non traditional times. And, you know, I advocate that in different areas. If you want to do game reduction, and we hear it in our country as well, we don't want to shoot very few And so I think trying to reduce numbers, and I know it's tough, but. That's the means to do it is get them when you can. And you know, when they're dispersed, they're dang hard to get numbers gone. And that's different areas, or if the elk or someone's creating refuge, maybe you're going to need to shoot some elk in March and, and July on the thing. Sign me up. Adam's in. You know, I, I think people are willing to do that. Hope you know, it tastes just as good in, in July as it does in September. So. <laughs> <laughs> On, on damage payments and what's happening in that case, could you actually provide what you would feel as a sound recommendation to the commission to do that type of innovative sort of season setting to, to, to help reduce some of those animal numbers? I can tell you during our season setting discussions, which we're starting now, which will continue on until the commissioner approves season in April, we have those discussions every year. You know, there's so some things about hunting elk, specifically elk after um, January 31st due to brucellosis and potential exposure to brucellosis. There's some specifics there, of, you know, of, of people really wanting to kill a pregnant doe or cow with the calf the size of your black lab and stuff like that. So some ethical moral things there and stuff. And it's not outside the box, but we look at every innovative way we can to come up with, with um, elk, number, uh, elk uh, reduction, damage reduction, but it comes down to Access and ability to get to those elk. Yeah. They're no less pregnant in October, though. <laughs> yeah, but the, you, the you optics see, are real different. It's a lot different when you. I you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for some people. Adam's still game. You know, I feel like people that kill elk in January and that you know that fetus is this oh, big, no. and that, that kind of turns them off. And you know, it's a, it's a personal choice, but that's you know, there's some things you have to you know, think about. Or what are you know, and our hunters are hunters actually going to be willing to go. And the other part is, if I kill a how well in July? Or am I going to take it? Can I can I get it out of the heat and get it cooled down a time without it spoiling? There's a lot of things you got to take into. Adam's already sorted that out. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's got, thank you again on a very yeah. good career. Thank you. Thank you.
Dan Smith, our Cody supervisor, is going to be my replacement in the in the interim until they find somebody who actually wants to welcome this to this to this world of paradise of cold damage and stuff. So, but uh, I'm not going anywhere. Like uh, Rick King says, I'm not dying. I'm just going into another phase of life. So, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and then we are going to take a break. Um, we've had some questions about public comment. Right now, those are scheduled um, after the committee has done some work on these issues for two and three. I will defer to the chairs. Um, I know sometimes when we have an issue that's like ripe, um, that you all want to open up public comment earlier, um, but just wanted to make it clear for folks in the audience. Um, right now, that's scheduled towards the end. Um, chairs can open it up earlier if they choose um, on specific topics. Um, also, we have... Um, you guys wanted information about land swaps last time. Given our technological challenges and that Jen is online today, I think we're going to kick that to our March meeting, just not being confident that we'll, we'll be able to get that presentation well from Jen today. Um, so I wanted to just let you know that that's our plan. That's still an idea that's percolating as a good solution, but we're going to get more information on that in March, given our technical challenges today. Um, let's take a break until... Oh. Yep, just one other thing. I think Carrie sent out a, a, a survey. Okay on meeting dates for May and June. So if everybody has a chance to maybe look at that. Um, I then, emailed um, it and at yeah. the end of the day today, we're gonna try to set some of those dates because places are trying to book. And we'll also talk about our March and April yeah. meeting dates um, later. How long of a break do we need? Mr. 15? Chairman, real question. Go ahead. Oh. I'd like you to reach out if it's Coke Center committee to try to do, see if we can set one of our committees together with the DRW. Because I think you'll find back to these bills we're doing, if we can get the TRW committee that we have today that overlap and get part of that committee to come in, they'd understand better what that this committee does. Okay. I think it would help. We can touch base with Jamie to see if that would help you. All right, how long do we need for break? 10 minutes. 10? All right, coming back at uh, 10 51. Um, so because we have, you know, we have some weather going on around the state, and I know some people have come here to, to speak, um, we'll, we'll open it up, and it doesn't look like we're going to have the capability to take anything online, but I know we have some folks here. Um, if you want to wait and, and give your public comment at the end after we've actually talked about some some of the meat and potatoes things, great. If you uh, if you know you have to hit the road and you, you made a trip here to, to speak, um, we want to certainly want to give you that opportunity. If you want to do both, you don't have to tell us you're going to speak again. <laughs> so, um, so we'll just take some public comment right now. And, and if I could get you, we have about 10 people on the list. Um, if you can, you know, keep it to a couple minutes, um, that would be super. But certainly, you know, we'll be we'll be flexible on that, um, especially if you're taking questions. So we'll start. Go ahead. Yeah, and we'll, we're just ready to have you. Speak into the microphone so we, we make sure everybody can hear. And um, so. I hear it, it really makes a difference for folks online. Even if people in the room can hear you without the microphone, it really helps for the folks that are online. Um, so just hold it nice and close to your mouth. Um, sometimes when people are speaking, they start to lower it down like this, and it, it picks you up best when it's nice and close to your mouth. Karen, just to, if you want to tell people, uh, we can still get chat. Just, okay. Uh, as long as you let them know, they can write it in here. And I'll okay. it so, folks. Folks online, um, since we are not quite set up right on our uh, Zoom for you to speak in person, if you want to put a message in the chat, um, Todd has been practicing his voices and he will do his best imitation. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Todd will read those comments from chat um, to the group so we can get that feedback from folks online. I think at noon they're going to be able to fix this. Perfect. And at noon we should be able to fix the setup online so folks will be able to participate directly then. Thank you. Okay, so um, first up right. is Keith Tyler. Keith, yeah, come on up. <laughs> um, my name is Keith Tyler. I'm a landowner and um, avid sportsman. Um, I want to start off by thanking the task force for its, uh, its work and efforts. Uh, I know this is uh, one of those hard jobs that uh, doesn't always have easy answers. Um, I'm here to speak about the uh, landowner permits for elk in particular. Um, I have an interest in that because I'm currently trying to acquire this property uh, that's in elk country outside of Douglas. Um, it's just a 400 acre parcel though, so 
I have a concern about how that's going to affect, have you hold it up and affect my Thank ability you. to uh, qualify for landowner tax. So the property has historically had landowner tax. Um, so I'm trying to understand you know, what's driving um, the proposal that's currently being considered. Uh, as I wish I could make these comments after we heard uh, those proponents of present and bring more information. So all I'm able to refer to at this point is what I've been able to see on the web page, which lists the areas and the number of landowner permits and how those are broken down. Um, and I'm assuming that there's a perceived problem um, with, with those breakdowns. Uh, I can see that there are definitely some areas in the state that have some fairly high uh, award of, of landowner tags in relationship to the overall uh, quota for that area. Uh, and maybe that's the problem that's driving this. Uh, in area seven that I'm particularly interested in, it doesn't seem to be as big a problem. Uh, there are 1,500 uh, permits issued for area seven. It's a very healthy health population tax, perhaps too healthy, um, and reducing landowner tax in that area could have a reverse effect um, by uh, limiting the, the uh, harvest in that area. So that's something that uh, I think ought to be considered. Um, the other thing that I saw was the uh, uh, breakdown on uh, how many current landowner tags are allocated based on size of parcel. Um, and clearly, the, the bulk of landowner tags are allocated to uh, parcels under a thousand acres. So I can see how this could greatly reduce the number of landowner tags. I'm just not sure that that's uh, the fair way or the best way to approach the perceived problem. Um, so I'd like to learn more about the perceived problem, how um, it's being proposed to address that problem, and see whether alternatives uh, have been considered. It seems to me that uh, perhaps if there's a problem area as opposed to blanketing uh, this uh, proposal to uh, a thousand acres, uh, maybe there's a way to address it based on percentages uh, that are actually awarded out of that pool of qualified members. Maybe there's a uh, some sort of a draw system that could be implemented in those areas. Um, I'm also interested to find out uh, and again, you know, the studies that have been done, if, if, if they have been done, uh, on the perceived problem, uh, does the problem arise because of uh, inappropriate uh, subdivision of properties to, for the sole purpose of qualifying for a <coughs> tax? That's contrary to the statute, but I don't know whether that's been enforced, and I don't know if that's part of the problem. Um, those are things that, that I would certainly like to learn more about. Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, in the acquisition of this potential property, would you be open to either access to or through that property if a landowner tag was tied to access, assuming it butts up to public ground or available land? It's a tough question. Um, the uh, Obviously, I'm acquiring the property in part is the elk hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to have the first shot at the best elk hunting. Sure. Uh, I might be open to a late season uh, access um, when I've had an opportunity uh, to harvest. Uh, it's a very long season in, uh, in this area, so that's uh, something that uh, I might be open to. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to be able to control hunting on it. I wouldn't want it to be a blanket access. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, somehow I've got to be able to. You're not close to the conversation, though, on it. Thank you. you know, yeah. I have a property. I have a friend that has a basin property, and uh, we have uh, some deep seated uh, love for the area and for protection, protecting it for uh, elk habitat um, and the elk population, and hopefully the deer population, which has mm -hmm. fallen uh, off dramatically in that area. And hopefully that can be restored to some level that's uh, more desirable. So we, we definitely want to work with game and fish uh, in the management of the open area uh, as well as here in other wildlife. Thank you. Any other questions? Who's next? 
It looks like Peter Nicholson. Nicholson. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Peter Nicholson. If, come on, come on, the microphone. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if I could wait until the uh, end of the conversation. Sure. I might be uh, able to respond to some of the information presented. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Mangus. Exciting seeing new faces today. There's some of you that I'm like, oh, that person's back. And I'm like, oh, we got some new folks. So appreciate you coming. Um, my name is Lisa Mangus, and we also have property um, just south of Douglas. And um, we bought the Corduroy Creek Ranch um about on october 22nd 2019. very excited about it have worked our whole lives to be able to buy a piece of property like this kind of when i was just i, I feel like i'm going to tell the same kind of story you do like um i'm third gen uh, second generation native wyoming um my kids both went to school um, at the university of wyoming and so did i and so did my husband and um my son and my daughter had to go out of state to get their doctorate. Um, one went to Rochester, Minnesota to the Mayo Clinic, and the other one went to New York to an NYIT to get their doctorate so they could come back to Wyoming and live this Wyoming lifestyle as professionals. Um, it's tough to get uh, young people to come back to the state, so I'm thrilled that my kids came back here. Um, we love hunting and fishing. We love <coughs> being up in the mountains. As a matter of fact, when my son was seven years old, we bought a cabin up in the same area, and um, we didn't even have a home. But we felt like our priorities were right because we felt like um, having that land up there, just 80 acres, was just like amazing. So in 2019, we bought 660 acres thrilled that we were going to get a couple of wolf tags that we could share with our kids and um, share some time with them and so this has been very disappointing for us to hear that we may not qualify for these landowner tags because this is like part of our lifestyle and um i mean love for our land and so you know i, I just want you to maybe reconsider this um, maybe lower it a little bit because we just you know Spent a, a lot of money on this land. <clears throat> Sorry, we spent a you know we we spent a lot of money on this land, and we knew that we would get we would be able to qualify for two landowner tags because we've been up in this area of the uh, the neck of the woods for 27 years. <laughs> so we knew that we would be able to do that. Um, one of the things we talked about is maybe at some point before we retire giving a couple of parcels to the conservation district and um, you know just helping out that way but we don't want to split this land up we want it to be just one piece we're hoping we'll have a grandchild someday that we can um, pass it on to but right now we don't have one and so I mean we have to look at just different alternatives for um, what to do with this land but we want to be responsible for it and um, you know and it's just been a way for our family to bond and be together. And uh, I can't tell you the joy it is for us to be able to like have our adult children come back and um, want to spend time with us because we have this cabin and um, five minutes away is this property that we bought. And um, we looked for property up there for you know five or 10 years and we want somehow to have a legacy piece of property where we can hunt and enjoy it. And so, hearing that kind of is breaking our hearts and so i just wish you could consider maybe lowering the amount of acreage that uh that you're requiring so that maybe we could qualify so anyway that's my spiel i mean that's how our whole family feels about this land um in 2020 my daughter she shot her first bull elk it was a six point it's in her office in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, it's fun for her because all of the uh, men in the office, <coughs> or when patients come in, they always think that some man has shot the elk, and she's like, no, that's my elk, and so it makes her, you know, it's very fun for her, and so she actually is into eating organic meat because she's on, on that keto diet, 
And so, um, so she, this was important to her to be able to like be able to hunt and, and um, get it, get an opportunity every couple of years to do that. So my, um, my husband's wife grew up here in Casper and um, her husband, Ray, I mean, her dad raised this family of three girls. She, when he, she was two years old, um, you know, he took them and um, raised them on his own. And they grew up on elk and deer and antelope. And she loves to hunt too. So this year, she got an opportunity to try and get a bull. She didn't get one. She was pretty disappointed. But, um, you know, I mean, this opportunity for a family is so very important. And so please reconsider or lower the amount of acreage that you're willing to um, consider for this. I just would appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions for Lisa? Brian? Yeah, just, Lisa, just I want to make one thing really clear. So sure. the committee hasn't even considered this. Okay. So there was a small group that, mm -hmm. and that the committee said, hey, throw something on the wall to start the discussion. But there's no, most of the group hasn't even contemplated what's what's out there right now. Okay. So, so really, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just I'm just really glad that I'm here on the ground level of this. Um, so that, you know, maybe you guys can hear our points of view of somebody who's like worked their entire life and um, this has been their goal to have a piece of land like this. So. I have a question. Adam, I'm going to be a broken record. I'll ask the same question I asked Keith. And thank you, for, first of all, for uh, sharing. Um, would the access conversation be a non-starter? Would you be open to that? Um, you know what? I I don't have a point of view on this. I would have to I would have to talk to my family about this. So you know I I I, I wouldn't know the answer to that right now. So I you know I need to talk to my son and my husband and my daughter and my daughter-in-law before I would answer a question like that. I'm sorry. So. Yeah. Just a quick question. You sure. know, you're currently eligible for the land owner permits, and you're getting this. Yeah. So what work have you done with the with the department? Because it's not only just a uh, an acreage threshold, there's an animal use day. So have you worked with your biologist or game warden to try to document the amount of use that you have on that property? No, you know, like um, we're really new at this. Um, we, we got the land in 2019, October 22nd, and I didn't know we needed to work with our land, anybody. Um, I will tell you that the other day, um, my, my husband and a couple, and my daughter and daughter-in-law, and my um, my son were up there, and they saw a 40 head of elk. But I I I didn't know we were supposed to work with anybody on any of this stuff. So this is like really virgin territory for us. I don't speak this language, and um, I'm sorry. You know, I I um, this is all very new to me. So at least I think to maybe address Senator Hicks's question though, when you first acquired the property. The game warden did do an assessment. Oh, yes. Um, Rob Lieber, and he's pretty tough. He's a tough cookie. I don't know if you guys know him or not, but uh, um, we actually had sat down and had a meeting with him, and he told us he won't um, give out el elk tags until after the property is bought. We had already bought the property, but he, he told us that, and um, then he goes up and he looks around and he makes sure and I can I can assure you there's a lot of elk in there. <coughs> section seven but sorry I, I like I say I don't understand this language so Mr. Chairman that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a question waiting to witness. <laughs> I think the game word in job test that top cookie top, top cookie he, he is very he's he's yeah and um, we like him because he actually um, he takes his job very seriously and he's very passionate about what he does. And um, we just had a couple of meetings with him and we, you know, I mean, we, Thank you. we, we didn't know that. So. Sorry, do you have a question? Sure. Lisa, I, and you're new to this, so I am. this may not be a fair question, but there has to be a, a number somewhere in minimum acreage. It's, it's, it, there just does. There has to be a number somewhere. So what is that number? Well, for me, it would be 500 acres. Okay. 
thank, thank you, Lisa, for your time. We have a good group of uh, Nathan Miller. What's that expression where you say it depends on where you sit? <laughs> 500 years. Uh, I'll start with saying that I'm super nervous. I don't like talking in front of people. And your question as an outfitter is the minimum number of acres has been established. This has all been established. It's 160. It's 160 acres. If it has already been purchased before something has been changed, the animal use night requirement is there. Nobody who has previously purchased a property that, that qualified for tags is it fair to take them if it meets the animal use nights? So you could grandfather everybody in and going forward, make changes. Um, <clears throat> there's also the possibility that you could set the quota independent of landowner tags as many landowners hunt their own ground and this would alleviate the problem. Uh, Anybody who's an outfitter and a semi-knowledgeable hunter knows that quality supersedes quantity big time when it comes to acreages, which would be the animal use night requirement. Uh, you could hunt a quality 160 acres or even 80 acres, which I'm not at all proposing to be lower. That would be significantly better than hunting thousands and thousands of acres that aren't that are marginal or poor habitat. Um, I would assume if we're gonna follow science and with the recommendations, <laughs> having live water would also be a major plus in a high desert state, which would again lead to the requirements are already there and don't need to be changed. There's a the animal use nights and if it's good habitat and you have water, there's nothing to be discussed. I've had multiple game wardens tell me you're providing more in habitat and feed than the two tags that you're getting. Um, and a side, a side note, I know there's multiple proposals out there. Currently, according to the parcel size, um, the landowner tags that are given, there are 1,458 in the state, according to the parcel breakdown. Um, with the proposed changes where the big, big landowners would get more tags and could auction them, there's 1,347. So the difference is actually negligible with that proposal, plus potentially two for the 261 properties under the 640 threshold that have 160 acres of cultivated cropland, meaning that if 21% of these meet the criteria, there are actually less tags for the regular sportsman. I think it is unfair and immoral to change the rules in the middle of the game. You can in good faith change them going forward, but you must be realistic as some of us do not come from generational wealth and changing the rules to benefit, in my mind, big landowners, if they get more tags and outfitters is immoral, unethical, and could even be illegal. Uh, and then I pulled up an article uh, from the state statute that a uh, a member who has personal or private interest in any measure or bill proposed or pending before the legislature shall disclose the fact to the house of which he is a member and shall not vote thereon. So uh, in my eyes, if you have an acreage where you would get another landowner tag, you need to recuse yourself from even voting and probably from the community. If there's any questions, I'll any to... questions for Mr. Miller? I'll throw the same question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would you have any misgivings if an access conversation was tied to landowner tags from the 160 up? Uh, I would have an issue, but I'll ask you the same question. If you I bought the land. Mm -hmm. If your grandpa gave you a 160 or a 240 or a 640, would you let the public hunt there? 
So to turn that back, the question on you, uh, you said if you hope we follow science, landowner tags typically are type ones. There's zero, well not zero, there's very little management impact of taking bull elk or buck deer out of the population. So what difference so, the number of tags? And there? Well, that's again, opportunity for sportsmen. And that's generally what this task force was set up for, was to set up to benefit Wyoming sportsmen. I mean, it's in our very first I, I would disagree with the, that of the task force of Wyoming sportsmen because I don't see how an outfitter is representing Wyoming sportsmen and the Stock Growers Association is not really representing Wyoming sportsmen. I don't just disagree with that statement either. So uh, if it's representing sportsmen, there's nobody in here that could say in Wyoming sportsmen, the 90 10 split should pass. Without question, Wyoming, that's what Wyoming sportsmen want. To a certain degree, I don't disagree. But there's no to a certain degree. Oh, other absolutely. than outfitters, every resident wants that. <laughs> not, not true. But thank you. Any, any other questions for Mr. Miller or Dwayne? Well, just, just a statement. I, I, you know, I agree with Adam that it's brought up the point of the resident sportsman. Our, our committee was also tied to recognizing the contributions to ranchers and landowners in the state of Wyoming and what they do for wildlife. So I think well, those that, things have to be taken into consideration. I, I think it's, I, I agree and I'm not opposed to the landowner tags. I think a fair solution could be on top of the quota because if you own a big acreage, you control the, those animals and if you need more tags, but I don't think it's right mm -hmm. to pay change an existing rule and take from the little guy, I guess is my point. Joe? Yep, Mr. Miller, one of the things that I think I'm still grappling with, um, especially as we consider size, allocation, and everything, <clears throat> is the difference between um, landowner tags that recognize the, the, the right, in many ways, the gratitude that we express for a landowner for having that property to hunt on that property. So. So if, if we were to propose a change that would make landowner tags only eligible for deeded ground for your 160 acres, give, give me your thoughts and perspectives on that. Because I think that's one of the things we, we struggle with, or at least I'm struggling with, is um, a landowner tag that opens up the opportunity for an entire unit versus deeded property only. Uh, we own more than a 160, but uh, I would I don't think there's an issue with the way it is, but that would be a more fair way than just taking them. I'll say, I'll say, it in my opinion, if you had to make it that way, that would, you know, be more fair than just you did qualify and now we're changing it. You know, because some people, you know, I mortgage my house to help buy a recreational piece of property knowing the rules going in and the change of mid game does not seem fair to me. All right. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Scott Miller. I'd like to wait until we hear your discussions. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Dax McCarty. <laughs> Anybody coming through the middle there? There is a microphone cord that Dax just navigated deftly, but be aware. <laughs> uh, I don't. I guess I would just ask when you guys are considering this change. It, I mean, I know you guys understand it's a tough. It's a tough decision. There's a lot of people impacted. A lot of uh, going to be a lot of discussions moving forward. But I think um, I think I would hope that the task force considers game management and biology and science as well as far as, you know, I, I don't know, I would question the, the comment that there has to be a minimum acreage. I don't know that that's, there, there has to be, maybe there does, and I, I'd love to hear an argument to, to support that. I think you, you know, there was a couple of good points brought up about, you know, the animal usage, the habitat, and I think that factors, should factor into this decision as far as, you know, how, how these landowner tags are distributed is, is you know how how efficient is that land as far as supporting supporting wildlife? So that's kind of my main point there. 
Adam, you want to? So I, I think, I think to, to your point or to your question, um, you know, it's, it's private land. Um, just like, you know, a private landowner has the, has the right to outfit on their property. Um, you know, you're talking private land and they also have some programs that they can, you know, participate in access. Yes. And some other things. So, you know, those things already happen. Um, I think it's when you're you're paying for that land. I think you have the right to decide how you're going to use it. So, that's my answer. So, I got a question for you. So, you know, in the and not and it's not an issue on my side. Of the story, but on these areas, on a hunt area where, let's say, 60 or 70 percent, I haven't looked at the data, is is taken up by landowner tags, in particular. And let's just talk about the units, all which be those. What, what kind of things do you think we should do or consider to do? Um, should we have a like a landowner draw if it, it exceeds 50% of the tags in the area? Of it? And I know that you, I know you're going to think of it through the lens of your property, but think of it through the lens of the larger issue. Well, we right, and I and I don't I, I'm not I'm not up here speaking as a landowner because I'm not I'm a I'm a manager for for a large landowner. Um, I. I think that's one of the toughest things, probably some of those highly limited tags and the landowner tags issue. And I know that's going to be, I mean, you're going to have to differentiate there. And that's where I think herd management biology is going to have to come into play um, when you're deciding what, how you're going to move forward if you are going to change anything. But I come from an area where it's, it's a large, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of private, a lot of public, but it's the access is really tough. Uh, for the for the public hunters, it's it's a big issue, and it's also um, we're, we have an excess number of, of animals, and we have an overcrowding of, of public land. So it's that's a whole. I mean, those are two ends of the spectrum right there. That you know, I have more perspective probably from that end than I do the limited, highly limited tags. And I understand that's a big issue. So. Let me uh, let me ask you one more question. Since you're a manager of a large brand, what if that Ranch has LLCs and they spin off little sub LLCs to like 10 million different people, and then they can each be eligible for one of these tags. How do we get our arms around all of that issue, or should we get our arms? Around? Oh, I, I think that has to be considered. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, our particular ranch owner doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, you know, sometimes the tags are donated to veterans and it's they're not used, but it's. I think that's uh, yeah, that's got to be controlled somehow, personally. So, thank you. Any other questions for Dan? That's the channel's getting all that. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, Dustin Ewing. I hold my breath every time somebody goes over that court because personally, I about take it out every time. So. I'm Dustin Ewing. Um, I'm a landowner. I'm a land manager, like uh, same as Dax, for a large uh, landowner, and I'm also a sportsman in Wyoming, and I'm a father of four. I got uh, three boys and a daughter, <clears throat> so I'm kind of here on kind of trying to educate myself, see what the issue is, why we're talking about this change. Um, I too have worked tirelessly to be able to acquire a piece of property, and in the last couple of years, I've been able to do that. I uh, acquired 440 acres. I knew it had great um, wildlife habitat on it, and I knew there was options for landowner tags, and so I went after it. <clears throat> and I, and there was a question earlier in, in about the habitat, and I'm really habitat conscious. Um, I've already started working with the uh, state forestry and working on some forestry projects and some uh, wetland improvements and that kind of stuff. But this thing really kind of hit, hit home here. Um, we were talking about changing, in my case, 440 to uh, 640 or 1,000. And I really just thought back about, you know, these landowners in this particular area, which just happened to be Area 7 south of Douglas, super prime area. You know, the landowners are really supporting this wildlife uh, number we've got down there, even from the ranch that I manage. Um, and I don't think... Damages are, are driving any of this issue. I think people are just, they want this experience. They want our kids to stay in Wyoming. I've got a kid that's getting ready to go to Laramie. He could go anywhere he wanted to, academically, athletically, but he wants
wants to stay in Wyoming because this mountain land we bought. Um, so it's kind of gets emotional because we worked so hard for this. And just to hear that this this concept, and I've, I've talked to the stock growers and I understand their point of view, I understand everybody's point of view, but you know, we had a statue on the books that kind of laid this out. And uh, you know, we kind of went down that road because of that. And so that's, that's why I'm here. Um, to answer your question, <laughs> you know, so first of all, we, we did enjoy our landowner's tags this year. We opted to hunt just our private property. We didn't harvest anything outside of that. And my son's like, I don't really care to go hunt anyplace else. It's really special to hunt our ground. And that's the way we, we hunted it this year. We didn't get anything. So, and then to allow access on top of that, I think Dax is right. There, there's tools, mechanisms in place for that already. And I think uh, a lot of people participate in that. Some do for whatever reasons. It's private property and they got those choices to make. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really think that system's broke. Um, you know, I know there's varying degrees of problems and stuff across the state, but I, you know, Wyoming's well, kind of a special place, and if we start changing things up, are we going to make it worse? Earlier, Mr. Hicks said you pull one string, it's going to pull multiple strings, and I kind of think that's where this is going. Question. All right. So one of the issues we're grappling with, and I think you illustrate one of the things we're trying to grapple with, is there's an increasing demand for the amenities that the properties have. And so I think somebody alluded it to earlier, but when I went through the data, I noticed several units where there's, that there's already the bulk of the, of the, of the quotas, and they typically are the high demand units. So the private land composes, let's say 20%, of a unit, but there's enough eligible landowners to get almost all or 75% of the tags, but the unit is 80% public land. So this is one of the issues that I can see going forward, but under a scenario, and it very well may be unit seven is one of those that we look at. Under that scenario, to try to honor the, the agreement and the, the reason that you want to stay here and your kids want to stay here is access. It's a supply and demand issue. There's public land component there, there's a private land. Is that something that we would be moving forward that you would consider that maybe it's not a landowner tag every year. Maybe it's a landowner draw that you know that you're gonna have a tag every two or three years. A scenario where we honor the agreement, but just because of the demand and the amount of public land involved in some of these units, we're just gonna to have to make a resource allocation adjustment well, what's your thoughts on some process like that? And again, I understand where you're coming from. We, we have to look at that equitable distribution. And I think this is one of the biggest things we're going to try to grapple with. with this. Okay. To ensure that you have that landowner tag because you're supporting those animals, and knowing that it's a limited supply and demand alternative. Is that something that we should take under consideration? I guess I don't have a great answer, but I think the the arbitrary approach is not the approach. I think it's more a scientific data based approach. And I think this 160 uh, animal units on your on your land was that approach. Is it still being followed? I don't know. But I think as wildlife managers, you know, under the state, they they have an obligation. Or maybe not an obligation, but part of our responsibility is to understand where this wildlife is coming from. And are you penalizing if you if you say the landowners that are growing and supporting this wildlife are going to be subject to a new draw system, whatever that might be? I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. I'm not opposed to any of it. And to be honest with you, if this whole thing goes away, I'll probably still enjoy my mountain property and, and keep clicking. But I uh, just wanted to reiterate that's that's why I bought, one of the reasons I bought it. Um, so I, I really think there's some there's some there's data and support. You know, maybe maybe next year, maybe two years from now, my land doesn't have any elk. Maybe they gravitate down to the river frontages, uh, 
which they are. I mean, they're, they're grabbing, they're moving. This elk herd is changing. Um, but I kind of think those mountain range areas are, are probably going to stay pretty consistent. I think it's interesting that all the people that have come before us today, the spirit of the regulation is to hunt your own property. And every one of these people that came here so far today, they are following that. They're not asking for a license to hunt the whole entire area. That is what one that Representative Summers was talking about. If if everything was as you portray it and the other people that come before us, we wouldn't be talking about it. It would be a non-issue. But because we're having people who are subdividing and doing these LLCs and, and whatnot, so that they gain access to the entire area, not just their own property. And, and those are the areas that we're struggling with, trying to figure out how to make that right, make that more equitable. But the people that, like yourselves and the others that, that have spoken, you're the true spirit of the regulation. Is to getting a license is to hunt your own property. Uh, I myself don't have problems with that. But it's when we try to abuse the system and to buy a parcel of land just so it, it meets our requirement. And now I can hunt everywhere. That's the problem that we're facing. And, and that's the struggle that I have with you. I would concur. I, I don't really disagree. I totally disagree with and my kids brought this up. Hey, Dad, we could probably split this up and all four of us could get a tag this year. I said, no, that's not the intent. And, uh, and so I've seen it. I've seen people try to split their thousand acres into, you know, twos. But... I don't know how you can control that one. So we don't even, we don't but also, I also kind of add to that breaking this property up. I think if we take this base 160 kind of program we got going and you devalue those properties, what's the what's that landowner to do to regain their um, their value out of that property? They're going to break it up in the 40s. I'll, I can show you some properties that are broke up in the 40s and what that does to those habitat areas. And it's not pretty. So, Justin, thank you for coming today because I think you're the perfect person to answer this question. I didn't realize you had, you had bought 440 acres. So, so one of the things that, that is driving this is the equity issue between a large property and a smaller property getting the same number of tags. How do we address that? And you're sitting right there in the middle. Yeah, you got me on the spot because I represent I represent Wagonhound. And here's a landowner because we try to do all the wildlife habitat. We, we have an outfitting business. It's more of a, a, a wildlife management effort than it is this economic driver. Um, he gets two licenses. I get two. If we're going to make changes, do we, do we say yeah, there's a scale, there's a floor, there's a ceiling? Um, I think the software has maybe presented something to that tune. You know? How do you feel about it? <laughs> Probably, if we're going to talk about fairness, yeah. Equity, I don't like the word fairness. Okay, equity. Maybe, maybe the landowner does deserve that. And maybe they need to be transferable. We, you know, they have a great transferable program right now. We do it through the veterans program. Um, but maybe they, maybe there's other programs, you know. What would be the, what would be an equitable split? Between a 300,000 acre ranch and a 440 acre parcel. Now you're putting me on the spot here. I, I mean, I, I don't know. We're looking I mean, hey, we, we've, got a, we've got a system in place. I don't think it's broken. Two is fair for the two. Maybe it's six to 10 for a, up to 100,000 plus or something. But it really depends on what kind of wildlife they have. I'm going to ask you another question. So, so let's say we, we explore the idea of transferable land over licenses. So let's say Wagonhound, some kind of system comes in place where Wagonhound has access to 10 licenses instead of two and transferable. Do you think at that point in time, because we, we would have an impact issue, I mean, if, if they were allowed, obviously that's not an issue on Wagonhound, but on, on other parcels of ground, should those licenses be contained to that ranch that if they're allowed to transfer them, they can't go outside the borders of that ranch to hunt that resource? I would, I would think that's more than equitable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Two check. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Any other questions for Justin? Thank you. Uh, Charles? All 
walk around your court. I, I do. <laughs> you do you, but this is a safer path. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'm really in the right spot today uh, for this. We come here, three of us, all neighbors from Area 6, uh, Elk Hunt Area 6. We've got a tremendous problem down there, and I don't know if you can help us with it or not, but we need help. I'm going to give you a little bit of the, my family history in Area 6 and uh, a little bit of the history of the elk down there. My family's been down here in the Iron Mountain area since 1886. Uh, we bought the ranch that we're on now currently in 1903. My grandfather and my father <laughs> have run it and I'm on it along with my sons. Grandfather and dad never saw an elk there. Dad first saw elk there about 1975. At first we thought, boy, this is kind of neat to go out and see half a dozen head or a dozen head. The elk got there courtesy of the game and fish. They were planted on the Plumbago Canyon Ranch. It was owned by Tom and Kathleen Moore. Tom Moore was an employee of the game and fish, longtime employee. There was no environmental impact statement at the time. There was no consultation of the neighbors, the neighboring ranchers. The elk were uh, put out there. Uh, the, game, the game and fish biologist at the time was Bill Hepford. For years, when pressed on this issue of where the elk come from after they, after they got to be a problem, the game and fish told us they didn't have anything to do with it. However, one of our neighbors, Bill Schaefer, come along while they were dumping them out on the county road. The records were eventually discovered by the Game and Fish, and they said these elk could not survive the, the transplant, that they were no longer in the area. It's kind of like when they put the wolves in Yellowstone Park. Nobody told the wolves to stay in Yellowstone Park. Nobody told the elk that they had to stay on the Plumbago Canyon Ranch. Right now, we think we have an excess of about 5,000 elk in the area. The herd has been mismanaged by the game and fish, we feel, for years. What they did as far as management, the original objective was 300 head. I believe with 75 head on the National Forest, which is up there between Cheyenne and Laramie, the Medicine Bow Forest. What the game and fish has done over the years is raise the objective instead of manage the elk. We have gone from 500 elk objective to 800 to 1,000, and now our objective in Area 6 is 1,800 head. We're so far past this objective, we conservatively think there's 5,000 head of elk in this area. We have worked with the Game and Fish for years. We've been part of an HMAP area, which was pretty successful for a year. We've allowed hunting. We don't charge anything for hunters. We found that the more hunters we take, the less less elk we kill. In, in uh, the last year, where we allowed unlimited access to the ranch, we had over a hundred hunters, and it's the fewest elk we've ever killed. What we do now, and I, we don't charge an access fee. We we take the first thirty hunters that call us. We'll only take two hunters at a time, and then we take an additional list, and as, as they fill out, we let more on. We, we'll take the names March 1st. My son Tom takes it. He won't answer the phone before 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. By 5.15, he's full with the additional names. We've got a big problem. We're looking for solutions. We've got a lot of private land in this area. There's very little public access or public land, uh, it, it, it's mostly all private. You're talking about whether you should, and, and I respect a, a fellow's property rights. I feel if he's bought the land and he's paying the property taxes on it, I don't might, might not like what my neighbor's doing if he chooses to put up windmills, if he chooses to allow hunting or not hunting. He owns it. It should be his decision to take care of it. 
we've got problems in that we've got some big area or big landowners in our area that don't, don't allow access. They just allow trophy bull hunting. They don't want to kill the elk because they're afraid of running the cows. They run the cows off, the bulls will leave. Anyway, we're, we're looking for solutions. <coughs> it's starting to impact us on the number of cattle we can run. We figure it, it's costing us about 150 yearling steers a year that we can't run. If you do the math on that, and this is just my rough figures, last year we sold our steers, they brought $1,434 a head. If you multiply that times 150 yearling steers that you can't run, that comes to $215,100 annually. If you don't think that doesn't make a change to your operation, let me tell you, you got something else coming here. Now, if you figure the cost to run a yearling steer, we figure $20 to $25 a head, depending on who cares for the animal and on the, and the lease in the land. For example, $20 a head to run a yearling steer would just be for the pasture lease. $25 a head for that same steer would be, the high end would be for the pasture lease, the labor on the fences, the salt, the mineral that you put out. Anyway, if you add this all up, we figure these 150 head elk that we probably would run year round. Some year, some days you can go up there, you can't see an elk. Some days you can go up there and see eight, nine hundred, a thousand head in a bunch. If, if you run the 150 head, which we figure is what our daily average is, at $25 a head per month, that comes to $3,750 a month times 12 months. That's $45,000 annually. This is a big impact on our ranch. I, I'm here, I just asked this task force what you have as far as solutions. <clears throat> that, that's about the end of my spiel. I'm willing to take questions. Charles, I have, I have a question for you. I mean, you have obviously just a, a storied amount of history on that landscape that, and, and seeing this robust population of elk, what, what have you seen in the changes in the impact? That's had specific to mule deer. <laughs> we, we have less mule deer now than we've ever had. The, the mule deer have it awful tough in our, our area of the country. We've got chronic wasting disease. We've got mountain lions. We've got coyotes. But the big thing is the amount of habitat that the mule deer are losing to the elk. And, and I think anybody that's been out in our area knows it used to be a great mule deer area. We, we had big deer. We had a lot of deer. We've got less and less deer all the time. Yeah. So obviously it goes back, some of it can go back to this damage issue. Obviously you're not, or not putting in or not getting out of the damage process because it's, uh, so talk a little bit about the damage. Well, we are getting some damage. However, it's compounding the situation. We've got the game of fish out there as soon as the season ends, they're out there at least twice a week running the elk off of us, counting the elk. That's how we determine the numbers. Last year, we got paid for, I, I think it was a little over $3,000, 3500 for fences and for the amount of elk we're running. However, when they run the elk off, they're running them on to my neighbors. Now my neighbors are here. They, they've got the same issue with the fences, with the damages, with the amount of money it's costing. We've got a tremendous amount of population that has been mismanaged for years. Any other questions for Charles? Yeah. Uh, just, I guess I don't know, Charles, if this is a question or, or sort of a comment. This is the rub when they say that, you know, the system isn't broke, so why do anything about it? Here's a perfect example <clears throat> of, of some of the problems that we're having with the system that exists today. Because, again, in and Iron Mountain is the same in a lot of places in, in Area 7. You have the ranchers who uh, allow hunting, and then they have lots of hunters to try to reduce the numbers so they don't have as much damage. But then the more hunters that are there, then the elk don't stay, and they go on to the neighbors who don't allow hunting. And there's, there's the rub right there. Then how do you – and so one of the things we're trying to address is how do we – 
encourage or incentivize these ranchers, your neighbors that don't allow access or don't allow hunting? How do we incentivize them to understand when you talk about science, you know, the science says you got too, too darn many elk, but yet we, we can't deal with or we you know we're because of the private property rights which i'm 100 percent for how do you incentivize those people to allow more hunting so we can reduce these numbers so that everybody wins and or at least benefits and uh that's that's one of the big questions we have in our part of the state is we have guys who ranchers who allow hunting and to try to to reduce their numbers and reduce their damage, but then those elk know right exactly where to go, so they go to the neighbors who, and, and if you're if you're depending on your life, you know, your life is dependent upon your cattle operation or sheep operation, whereas the neighbors, they really don't depend on that to make a living. And so consequently, they're not as concerned about any damages that occur there, and and uh, that's, that's the rub we face. Well, I, I I think that's tough because I am a big uh, supporter of private property rights. Me too. And a lot of these guys that we have a ranch that have these big ranches next to us, I don't want to call them not ranchers, but they made their money elsewhere. They're not. It's more of a recreation deal than it is a ranch. It, they happen to be large. Oh. Um, the only solution that we've come up with, and, and I know the game and fish won't like it, but they've got to go in there and they've got to kill these elk. And it's going to be unpalatable to them. I don't think they, they want to hear this, but I think the only way they can do it is, is with a chapter 56 permit of some sort, where you go in, you allow the game and fish to shoot them. Um, we got issued a chapter 56 permit several years ago. I kept it all these years or this, the last several years just to show people. We tried to use it. It was good for my son, two sons and myself. We have to feed in the mornings. We're, we're done usually about noon or one o'clock. We went out the first day we got stuck. Second day we went out, we couldn't see anything. And the third day that my boys went out and they got stuck. Uh, it was after the season had ended. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't kill an elk. You had a question. I did a little. Uh, you're here with your neighbors and whatnot. If the opportunity presented itself that you could all block grounds up into an area and make it into a, a different area and had an opportunity to take advantage of being able to supplant some of that income that you lose off your yearlings with hunting operations, would that be part of an acceptable solution to more elk? No, I, I'm a cattle rancher. I'm not an elk rancher. That, that, that's not what I do. And it's one of those things right now, if you double this elk population every four or five years, we figure we have 5,000 now. You've got hunters that are going to kill a considerable number of elk in our area, but it's, excuse my language, it's like peeing in the ocean. You feel good for a little bit when you shoot a cow, but you look at all these big bunches of cows that are pregnant that are going to have calves in, in, in four or five years, however long it takes for them to double. Pretty soon we've got 10,000. Then in a few years later, you double that. You know, it, 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 the first time you double it and you, you, you've got 30 head of elk that have been planted on you, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal for 100. But after you get into these big numbers and you start doubling them, which we're doing now, you've got problems. I just had a question. What is, what is your, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just, you know, as a, as a, a land manager and a livestock manager, <clears throat> Do you feel that if there was an opportunity to take a more active role in managing that elk herd, would that be something that you would be interested in? Or do you just want to say game and fish go kill all of them? So where, where do you fit in as the land manager on this whole equation? We're allowing as much hunting as we can, as we feel we can bear. <clears throat> uh, we don't charge an access fee. This year, or the last two years, we 
we haven't let anybody kill any bulls. We're making them uh, kill cows only. However, what with our neighbors that do allow very limited access, they, they're killing the bulls. The cows go over there. There's not the pressure there that we put on. So I, I don't know. Uh, and the Game and Fish tells us they're, the elk belong to the state. They don't belong to me. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, so it's not always just about getting Connor. What if there was more flexibility within your operation? In other words, expanded seasons to be able to address this, and these type of management. And we now have a six month season in area six. Okay. Six months is plenty long enough. We, we have, as soon as the season ends, we have hunters calling us already <clears> for next year. The phone rings nonstop. I'd say we get four or five calls a day year round for hunting. <laughs> it, uh, we're, we're, I think we have as lenient a season as the game and fish will allow. Uh, we don't want them. We don't want hunters the 12 months out of the year. That, that's six months is too much. Too much. <laughs> All right, there was another question over here. Thank you, Charles. If you have any solutions, I'd like to hear them. I'll talk to you later. And if my younger group is remembering we're in there's policy solutions, right? Because our purview is a dominated inside. So where are the policy solutions that can help with these? Yeah, I'd like to answer one question. And this is I think a follow to the question that Charles asked earlier. Yeah. Is there a solution Conversations, remember that makes it hard for folks online to hear. So, if you can just limit your side conversations. And I understand your impact is different than mine. Mine is very good right? But how do, you, how do we, sometimes we ranchers forget that we have a wildlife resource on our ranch. And it's probably as valuable or more valuable than our livestock. And you may not be a Oh, elk rancher, but in fact, you are an elk rancher, whether you like it or not. So how do, how do we help you survive as one of the few ranches that are actually going to let people hunt and make it economically viable for you at the same time? I mean, this is a challenge, right? And it's not like you're going to go out and mow down all in elk. You're probably not going to do it. So how do we make it economically viable for you to survive? Take the mic. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how you do that. I, I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I think what you might end up doing is you might have to pay for the pasture. You you, you might, if, if you want this many elk, and if you're not going to control them, which obviously you haven't in the past, and the numbers continue to grow, they continue to get worse, I think the game of fish is going to have to come up with some money. Like I say, uh, you know, it, it, it's costing us a lot of money. This is the first year in my family's history at Iron Mountain that we have rented pasture for our yearling steers. We're, rent, we're fortunate enough to rent it from a neighbor. But because of the impact of the elk, we've had to go out and rent pasture. Uh, Charles, what you just mentioned is something that I've been talking about a little bit for, for you know since this task force was formed was we're going to rent pasture. But, you, and, and I thought, you know, that sounds like an easy solution. But you said earlier, you're not, you're not really interested. You're interested in raising cattle and not raising, raising elk, which I understand. I mean, that's, that's your prerogative. So, but then you said, do we, you know, possibly just rent the pasture? Is that something you'd consider? Well, we, we are renting pasture. No, but I, I'm saying game and fish basically renting your pasture for their elk. I mean, if, if the, the, the elk or game and fish is livestock. And I'm, you know, I'm a livestock owner, and I got to rent winter pasture every year for my for my horses, and that's just a fact of life. And if we're going to have this number of wildlife on the on the landscape in Wyoming, do we just just go out and buy pasture to to, to raise them? Where do you draw the line? That's how how many elk are acceptable? I mean, you're you're doing away with your deer deer herds in in our area. They're they're in sharp decline. I think the game and fish come out. We used to have deer that were big deer, uh, seven, eight, nine year old deer. Now, when they get to be about four years old, they just disappear, the, the, the bucks. Uh, 
you've got to draw the line someplace. And if you keep doubling this population every few years, you're just going down. You're, you're going down a hole that there's no coming out of. So, Mr. Chairman, that, that's one. Just to follow up, that's one component of it. Is is any good livestock manager should manage their herds. But the other component, what I would be suggesting, is even just all wildlife, whether it be an antelope herd, a deer herd, or an elk herd, the concept of just paying for that, the the land to raise those on, is that something that you as a rancher would consider? It, it would help. But again, I am not an elk rancher. Okay. All right. So uh, one last for me, because it goes back around to what I started asking you, and we kind of sidetracked off, and I was trying to figure out how to... My real question was, if all of you could get together, and I'm not asking about expanding herd, it's having actual input into herd objectives and where you're trying to go, could you folks get together and work on doing that? Because that's really where I feel is these bigger areas, you can block areas up and work hand in hand with the game and fish. It's really the only way that you can get honest objectives and figure out how to creatively do it. They've got the entire state to look at, but if you objectively, and I'm not sure I'm getting a look from the director here, uh, you know, we're entering into their management area, but it really, you manage on a personal level. And if it means that you can help them reduce that elk herd from 7,000 to 3,500, uh, you may have better solutions than them. Plus you have some of the tools they don't have because you've got the ranch. And that was where I was at, was finding those acceptable levels. And in some areas, it may mean on big blocks of land that you declare an entire area. I used to manage the Mosque block and it was interesting. Homestake Mining had it and it was a 50,000 acre block. But it was interspersed with all kinds of other areas and it made it impossible for them to manage it correctly. These, these elk though are smart. If we put pressure on them, they go where there is no pressure. And, and let we had the HMAP area where we had a number of ranchers in the area, the big ranches that are next to us, and it was pretty successful. Uh, several of them have said that they, they won't do it, that it was a one-shot deal, they, they didn't like it, they had too many people on them. It, it, it's the only way we've ever cut the cow herd down. Since then, and that's been a half a dozen years ago or longer, all we done is see these elk increase. We, we need some tough solutions from the game of fish. I, I don't know whether we go about this through the courts, whether we the game of fish comes up and, and, and I, I really don't care. I want them to pay for it. I want them to be responsible, but I, I want them to control their damn elk. <laughs> All right, Charles, thank you, sir. We, we still have two more. Uh, I, I think these might even be your neighbors. Uh, Don Willis? Yeah, I'll, I'll pass something to the next guy. Okay, uh, and our final comment to, here before we break. Uh, one, near Charles' neighbor, correct? Well, about 300 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> Todd signaling me. We've We've got two folks online as well, um, so hang tough. I know we're getting close to our lunch break here, um, but we've got two folks online um, that I think Todd will leave comments for. Thank you very much for having us. I'll be quick, and I'm going to address the economics of it more than anything else. Uh, my feelings, I'm a rancher, southeastern Wyoming. We ranch in uh, Hannah with Zilli Ellis. Uh, McFadden, Ty Siding, Albany 12, and the home place in Wheatland. We run a thousand head of mother cows and about 800 yearlings. We're all agriculture. I don't really want to be an outfitter. I don't want to be a guy. I want to be what I am, a rancher. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you a few examples. First of all, I've got, where is the director? Oh, you're going to love me. Uh, I think I think the model that the game and fish has used to manage elk is a complete disaster. I can see our deer population, our mule deer population, 
has almost diminished. We had some great mule deer hunting in our area. In Albany Quell, we can see that's gone south. Uh, I attribute a lot of that to elk going through our range. Uh, I hear all of you talking about licensing, getting extra license. We in southeastern Wyoming are to the point that licensing is not going to fix the overpopulation problem that we have with the elk. I don't think you're going to kill enough elk by selling licenses. So I'm going to have a few points. Uh, it's harder than heck for me. We'll, we'll see 1,100 head of elk. I don't know if Charlie told you that or not. 1,100 all in one pile. It was. It's not unusual for me to get on the phone, talk to Charlie. He said, "Yeah, I just counted 1,100." Willis on the other side of me, yeah, we got 1,200. I mean, we have enormous amount of elk. When they get done with my place, it looks like Jim McGagna has put 10,000 sheep on him. It's just <laughs> manure. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we have a problem. Uh, and I don't think licensing, we can talk all we want. I don't think it's going to solve the problem. Uh, the, the economics of it. Take a 400 cow ranch, 300 head of elk running on it. Elk is six tenths of an animal unit. A yearling is six tenths of an animal unit. I did the same research that Charlie did. Call people in uh, in the Laramie Plains. That grass is going for 20 to 25 dollars. Say 20 dollars. Very simple math. Times 12 months. That's 240 bucks for one elk. You're running 300 of them, it's 72,000, I think. I wasn't real good at math. That's what it is. Uh, so, on a cow calf basis, this is what it's costing me. I used to leave the meadows for early spring grazing. And I used to be able to get into that ranch the middle of April and live on the meadows, on old grass from the previous year. Now, there's no old grass left because of the number of elk. I used to leave in November. Now I have to leave in October because my range has been graced by elk. Sometimes 300, sometimes 1100. So those, those are the problems uh, on the cow-calf deal. I'll just give you an example this year. Some of you are ranchers. Hey, a $220 spare. 30, 11 cents, 11 cents a pound, 30 pounds of it, $3.30, some 60 days. That's what it's costing me over what it used to be like when the elk were managed properly or we didn't have the numbers. Uh, my ways to eliminate, or oh, I shouldn't say eliminate, alleviate the problem of this overpopulation of elk. And I'm sure you've heard it all, all before. I think we ought to change or amend the rules on grass where ranchers don't get compensated. I think it ought to be we get compensated in the wheatland plots of crop. I believe that grass is just as valuable to me as corn or alfalfa out there. So I, I would say that would be one thing to look at to alleviate the problem. We're not going to fix the problem until I get to the last two. <laughs> Extra land, owner's license, whatever you guys want to call transfer, transfer license, whatever. Extra land owners, that will alleviate. Compensate for fencing at today's prices. It cost us $14,000 to build a mile of fence up at the rocks. It's not unusual for us to go and have to rebuild a quarter mile of fence. So, so that would be the other one. Uh, compensate, I, I don't know where I'm wrong, but I think we ought to be 
think a rancher ought to be compensated the same way the value of a yearling is on grass. And that's the $240 a year. Now, here comes the good ones. You love this. I think the other, another thing we can do is relocate those elk. And I don't know if there is such a thing, director, or not, but if we can take, send them to Alabama, it'd be fine <laughs> with me. Uh, so, so that might be harder said than done. I don't know. And of course, the other one is that terrible word, depredation, that we talk about. My idea of depredation is not to go out there and slaughter the elk. We're not trying to eradicate the elk. We're trying to get this elk to a manual manageable position. Why, what's wrong with killing elk, harvesting elk, go ahead and give that meat to the needy, take the hide and sell it to Mexico someplace or something. If I was 40 years younger, I think I'd make a business of it. I, I, I would probably find a restaurant in New York that wants that lean meat that tastes like crap and I would sell it to them, you know, but uh, a lot of folks love it and that's great. I'm not against it. So, but, but anyway, that's, those are my points which that would alleviate the problem. I don't, they're not, depredation is, we're to the point, that's about the only thing that would. Okay, most concerning to me, and for those of you that have a little background on me, I came here from a communist country, so private property is just, it's right up there. This is what bothers me the most. By mismanaging the elk and running that many elk on my range, you are depriving me the opportunity of profitability. I let that one sink in for a while because that's how I see it. And I hope we never have to come to this, but I think this could be a taking. So, so I hope we come, everybody's pretty serious now. I tell you, the state of Wyoming has been great to me. I'm not gonna go lawyers, I'm not gonna go court. Court. I love this state. And my friends and customers have been great to me. I don't wanna do anything, but I do when it is my livelihood, I do need to get concerned. Like I said, I don't wanna be an outfitter. I don't wanna be a guy. I wanna be what I am, a rancher. And my kids want to be ranchers. And we love wildlife. It's just getting it, getting it to a manageable number, which I don't know what that is, Director. That, that's it for my spell. Thank you. Any questions, Any questions for Mr. Riz? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike Charles. All right, I think we've got two folks online and apologies for the clunkiness of this. Todd, have you worked up any special voices for us today? No. <laughs> no. Okay, I have two, uh, two points here. The first one is Chris Frost and, and Kristen asked me to read uh, his uh, messages or something in three parts, uh, basically on preference points for comments. Um, yeah, he did miss earlier uh, in the meeting, but he said the main question is after thousands of dollars and two decades chasing a non-resident tag draw guarantee, I'm only 45 with 21 preference points. How do I get my money back since I'm being knocked down to less than 1% draw chance for the rest of my life? Second piece is I've asked for uh, this, this, this statistics and haven't had anyone send them to me. I learned that all these changes after the December 3rd meeting, my the only statistics I saw on the task force website suggested I'd be less than 1% or at most 1.01%. But admittedly, I may not be looking at the correct data, but no one can direct me to that data. After that message, I did uh, send him a message to get him back on the website where the, all the data is. So he looked at that. Then his final message here is, he just said, thank, thank you for the data. And 10% is certainly better than 1%, but it certainly isn't 100%. While most would, would not have been 100% at 
at 45 years old and with 21 points already, I would have been at 100% and at a reasonably young age. That's the promise and dream I chased for over two decades. That is what you all have snatched from me at 10%. I could go on with the rest of my life and still never draw. And why not have gone to 80-20 allocations? I understand residents as the biggest stakeholders, but sheep are heavily hunted on federal lands and Wyoming relies heavily on non-resident tourism. Not just hunting and fishing, but tourism to national parks, Jackson, et cetera. 80-20 would have been reasonable, but you all chose to be less than welcoming to non-residents. And, and again, maybe I'm looking at the wrong documents, but the statistical analysis uh, was uh, that, that I sent to him does not show 10% chance in the, in the bonus system for a non-resident. At most, I see a 1.01% .01 um, in any comment and training. They, they can hear you when you, when you speak. Yeah, so uh, to that, I, we had another question. I don't know if it's the same person, but um, uh, Joe had, had responded to that person on email and, and um, you know, we had considerable hours worth of conversation about this. And um, that was why the recommendation was that we put this out long enough that those folks that, that had bought in and had the most uh, points that they would have a chance over the next one to two to 10, however <laughs> long this gets implemented through legislature, um, gives them a chance to plan and draw that tag. If he wants to draw a tag in the next four years, he's going to be able to do that. We're trying to honor that. I mean, we're trying to, to walk that line of at some point you have to turn that over uh, to because the data that we got was that you're not going to draw if you start right now with preference points. And so we, we did try to walk that line and that, and that's why we tried not to take anything away from anybody, but, but knowing that's a balance. So um, I don't, that might not answer the question, um, but, but we definitely spent hours <coughs> upon hours of talking about that. Anyway. Todd, any other comments from folks online? Yes, there's uh, one, one more. Um, this is from Rob Shaw. There's, uh, he's got a two piece uh, comment here. Number one, we're disappointed that out of the gate this morning, the task force decided against taking up the corner crossing issue, and especially that the sportsman representatives on the task force did not speak up. While we understand the current litigation, this is a huge issue with resident sportsmen and the current law is established by statute that is set by, that is set by law at the legislature. A new law could clean this up and the task force could help in that effort. The second part, we, we're also disappointed that so many of the task force members indicated this morning they felt free to testify slash lobby at the legislature against the recommendation forwarded by the task force that they didn't personally agree with. Isn't this what Mike Schmidt was doing and the other Game and Fish commissioners, including Mr. Doobie and uh, the governor fired him for it? Disappointed today that Mr. Doobie didn't challenge Representative Summers and the others on the task force more forcefully this morning and, and overall reinforces that resident hunters need to take our fight directly to the legislature. That's all I have. Thank you for reading this course, Tom. All right, we are at 12.15. Has anybody peeked? Is there a lunch out there? There is. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take a break for lunch at one o'clock. We're scheduled to have a presentation on wildlife crossings. Um, do we, so are we good to, to break until one o'clock and we'll come back for that presentation and then hopefully jump pretty quickly into substance and solutions then. Does that work? Yeah. All right. Break till one o'clock. We'll see you back in your chairs at one. Task force members, lunch is outside as per the vote.